You have entered the command zone, your destination for all aspects of Elder Dragon Highlander. Enjoy your stay. And we'll never be monarch, monarch. It, it don't run, run in our blood. That, that kind of draw just same for us. us. We, crave we crave a, a different, different kind of buzz. buzz. Mana ramp. Royal monarch. You get it. Yeah, yeah. What's up, everybody? You're watching slash listens to the Command Zone podcast. It's almost over. Commander Legends coverage, maybe. Don't I'm speak too ho- soon, Jimmy. <laughs> I'm your host, Jimmy Wong. Don't speak too soon. I, I won't, think I we won't. still there's this, there's a second part of this, and then probably one more thing where we kind of wrap up the year of Commander, which we'll talk about Commander Legends. Right, too. right, right. But yeah, we're getting near the end. At least there's a light at the end of the tunnel. I'm Josh Lee Kwai. How's it? How's it? So this is the first of two parts where we're gonna talk about the cards from Commander Legends that go in your ninety nine, the stuff that cannot be your commander. Yeah, we've seems it seems like we've only been talking about the stuff that's a, your commander, but there's actually tons of cards. In fact, we're holding five pages of outline in front of us. And there's only half of it. Yeah, there's only half of it. Uh, so today on the show, we are going to be covering three of the cycles as well as the colors white and red, and we'll do a little bit of a breakdown on how Boros is doing overall. But before we get into it, lots of cards means that you need to get some of them yourself. So head on over to cardkingdom.com slash command zone to purchase any singles, sealed products, anything you want in the world of magic. Card Kingdom is probably going to have it. And there's tons of Commander Legends stuff that we're going to talk about today. Lots of combo potential. And hey, if you sense a combo incoming that other people haven't heard of, get on there. Go to cardkingdom.com slash command zone, order before anyone else can get it. And then wow your opponents on the battlefield. It's also the holiday season, so uh, you know what the best gift for Magic players is? <laughs> Spoiler alert, it's Magic cards. Wow, so easy. <laughs> yeah, also Magic product. So a lot of people, you might know, they have like a specific deck. And mm-hmm. what a really cool gift to get somebody is the matching sleeves, deck box, and playmat that ah. go with their deck. Because a lot of times somebody has a deck and you're like, well, they know that deck better than I do. What am I going to do? Tell them, like, here's a card you need for uh, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but being able to sort of bling out the rest of what goes with the deck, that is a really cool gift idea. So we recommend, of course, Ultra Pro products, not only are they the best way to protect your game pieces, they're actually the ones that have the license agreement with Wizards, so they're going to likely have whatever character it is, Mm -hmm. whatever commander it is that your friend has the deck for. They're going to have all the matching stuff that goes along with it, and it's kind of just gravy that it also is the best way to protect your cards, make sure they don't get scuffed up or dirtied. Uh, They also have the relic tokens and really cool dice. So if you don't know what cards your Magic playing friends specifically want, then this. Yeah, some really sweet dice or some really awesome sleeves is another way to go. Ultra Pro really does make the best stuff. I could always use more cool D6s. I'll say that much. Yeah, for sure. You never look at like a metal D6 and you're like, I don't want that. (laughs) Yeah, just rolled away from my cards. Don't uh, do what Jamie did. We yeah, flipped a, a coin on mine. Okay. Uh, and the final way to support the show is directly at patreon.com slash command zone. We love our patrons. They get to see extra turns, game nights, episodes like that a day early without the ads, even though the ads are some of the things that people like the most. Uh, we also talk to our patrons every single day on our Discord for those at the right tier. Uh, we look at your comments. We respond to your messages. So if, it's a great way to get directly in contact with us and, you know, poke our heads and... Poke our heads. Poke our heads. What's the word I'm looking for? Pry Uh, some knowledge out of us. Uh, Pick our brains. Pick our brains. Poke our heads. Poke our heads. (laughs) We're off to a good start on this episode. We've Uh, been talking a lot lately, so, you know, sorry if we're a little loopy. Um, uh, we all, we, there is also an ad-free version of the podcast that gets posted every right. week, too. So uh, a lot of perks for patrons. Oh, and the outline. So if you want to see what we write oh, on yeah. these as well, and you want a text list of all that stuff, it's out there just for the patrons. And the last thing we do is shout out one lucky patron every single week. So this week's episode is dedicated to, to Paul Dyson. Dyson. Paul. Paul. You rock. Thanks, man. All right, let's get into it. Commander Legends, the new card analysis, part one. We always start out uh, these episodes by talking about the new slash returning mechanics in the set, which at this point, I feel like you probably know because we've been talking about the set for so long. So we'll mm-hmm. just go over them quickly. Um, the first is a new mechanic. There's really only one brand new mechanic in this set. Yeah, I'm actually kind of glad it allowed them to not get too into the weeds of like, oh, we have to print this mechanic on X number of cards type thing. And sometimes that can slow down development of what, you know, getting the stuff that we need. So the mechanic is Encore. It's a mana cost, usually a higher mana than the casting cost of the thing. You exile uh, a creature from your graveyard, and then for each opponent, you create a token copy of that creature that attacks that opponent this turn, if able. They gain haste. And then you sacrifice those tokens at the beginning of the next end step, and you can activate Encore only as a sorcery. Yep. 
We don't so, have to go into it much just because it, I don't think it actually applies to any of the cards we're going to talk about for these maybe colors. Maybe one. Uh, but the general idea is like, you know, more opponents, the better. You get three copies and that will be relevant uh, in certain scenarios if you want more creatures. Uh, but again, the mana cost is a lot higher typically. So that is going to be a barrier to entry. You need to ramp out or find another way to pay for that. I think mostly you want to like the card if it doesn't have Encore in order to put it in your deck if it does have Encore. Yeah, unless your deck specifically is trying to abuse that sort of effect. Um, and also at a certain point it gets worse right you draw yep. an encore game when you have one person on the battlefield against you then it's way worse, worse yeah <laughs> uh the next returning mechanic is cascade which everyone will remember from maelstrom wanderer uh cascade is a very value-based spell it's if a card has cascade on it it's when you cast this spell exile card from the top of your library until you exile a non-land card that costs less you may cast it without paying its mana cost put the exiled cards on the bottom of your library in a random order and because there are some cards in this set that has, have Cascade multiple times, multiple instances of Cascade each trigger separately. Uh, the one sort of main thing, well, I guess two things about Cascade. One is if you Cascade at instant speed, you can cast something that's not at instant speed yep. off the Cascade trigger. So you, you have an instant, has Cascade, hits a mana rock or something that you normally only cast a sorcery speed, Cascade as part of the res resolution of the trigger allows you to cast it at that point. Yeah. So you, you're effectively casting the mana rock at instant speed there. Second thing is the thing that you're casting off Cascade will usually resolve before the thing you cast that has Cascade. Right, yeah. Cast the thing with Cascade, Cascade's on the trigger, you flip, flip, find it, ah, and then boom, the thing goes on top if it's like an ETB trigger or whatever. Because Cascade is a cast trigger. It's not a upon resolution of the spell trigger. Yeah, or an enters the battlefield trigger. Ooh, I'm glad I remembered that because I was getting I nervous. Know, that was, I, yeah, I was oh, nervous no. too. I was like, uh-oh, uh-oh, is Josh going to falter? That's you can't help me with. Usually you can bail each other out. <laughs> I, know, right? I don't know what's in your head. I can't pick your brain. <laughs> All right. Andy, I can't poke your head. <laughs> I can't poke your head. I could, actually. I'm right here. Um... The last returning mechanic is Monarch. Uh, it's a uh, uh, basically a an emblem you get if it becomes it enters the game. If someone becomes a Monarch um, at the beginning of your end step, if you are the Monarch, draw a card, and whenever a creature deals combat damage to you, its con controller becomes the Monarch. So, it's a nice way to implement sort of like a outside rule into the game in a lot of ways. In terms of like now everyone has access to this card draw thing as long as you deal combat damage to the person that was the Monarch, you get to wear the crown. I like sort of thinking of it as an emblem. It's just an emblem that other people can grab from. From you yeah remember it is only combat damage that will that will take the right. monarch from somebody you have to deal combat damage to the monarch to become the monarch that will come up in this episode all right <laughs> yeah we usually talk about new plane new planeswalkers every set um because usually there are some new planeswalkers that the chandras and all yeah that, that yeah. can't be your commanders but there are only two new planeswalkers in this set it's jessica and tevish zot and we talked about both of those cards individually when we did our partner review episode so if you want to hear our thoughts on those two cards find the either partner review for red or black mm -hmm. um yeah that's where we talk about those yep uh okay so let's move on to our three big cycles the first one i'm just calling the mythic big spell cycle because they it's the all nine mana sorcery cycle <laughs> yeah they all cost six mana plus six generic man plus three of the color of the card so white blue black red or green um they're for, all sorceries they're all sorceries they're all nine mana and typically this is the type of spell that should win you the game we talk about this in terms of expropriate yeah. insurrection um and so i think you definitely can run these if you're playing Golos as your commander or Joda because these are cards that are allow you to cheat out these spells for cheaper. Yep. Um, and I think a good question to ask yourself with each of these, because they are nine mana, is one, are you comfortable and able to get to cast this in your deck? So are you super rampy? Are you going to cheat it out in any other way? Are games going to guaranteed go long so you'll get to there? Remember when we did sort of our mini stats episode about middle of this year, we found that on average you might cast like one seven CMC or more spell per game. You're not casting a lot of these. So these are going to sit in your hand unless you have a way to cheat them, cheat their mana cost for a, a large percentage of your games. Yeah, or you're just such a mega ramp deck that you'll have 14 mana by turn yeah. six or whatever it is. And, you know, in lower power play groups, maybe your whole play group and meta is just casting these huge spells. So that's right. Nobody does more. anything for seven turns. So we always get to that amount of mana. Sure. Uh, and then the other thing I was thinking, is the ability worth it enough? Is it flavorful enough? Is it powerful enough? Which one of these metrics are you going to really like put your stamp on and be like that's why it's in my deck uh because it's nine cmc oh yeah and also like does it just do something if not i've done nothing else to set it up because uh, the last thing i want is a nine cmc spell that i start the game with or draw on turn two 
and I it basically is like I mulliganed until I finally hit that amount of mana, and then yeah. I get to that amount of mana. I'm like, actually, this card's still not great because I needed to jump through a couple more hoops to even make it good. That's just generally not the kind of nine CMC spell that I want. Yeah, totally. <laughs> I want uh, my nine CMC <laughs> spells to be to like they just do their thing. I, nothing else really has to have happened. Yeah, and if you look at that's why expropriate, expropriate. It, it just does the thing. Insurrection requires people to have creatures, but that's typically something that happens. Um, Torment of Hellfire, or right? Exsanguinator, the type of spells that you can dump, dump that amount of mana into and they just do the thing right. i mean those are obviously better because you can do it for less if you want to and i know there's there's been a bit of backlash which is like you guys are playing too seriously these big spells are fun and cool and splashy they are none of us are saying that they aren't that thing but in general is i think this is a, a thing that people need to think about if you draw a card of seven hands and two of your cards are a seven and an eight drop it's as though you drew five cards into your hand yes. you don't even know if you're going to be alive by the time you get the mana to cast those cards so you need to view it that way in a lot of a lot of times so that's why it's bad to overload your deck with too many of these cards you're just going to have a worse time playing. All right. Also, we're a strategy-focused podcast. We're going to give strategy advice. You don't have to take That's it. That's a good point. You don't have to take it. But what are we going to talk about if we're not talking about what cards we think are good and not? All right. <laughs> Let's go into the first one. It's Triumphant Reckoning. Six white, white, white for a sorcery. Return all artifact, enchantment, and planeswalker cards from your graveyard to the battlefield. Okay. Okay, so this is really just bringing everything back here. Artifacts, enchantments, and planeswalkers. It's not everything. Oh, okay. It's it a lot. It doesn't say creatures. <laughs> yeah, that's actually interesting. Which is kind of big. Like, it's nine CMC. What? Just bring creatures back. Yeah, I mean, this again, obviously... How about, every, <laughs> how about all permanents, by the way? Because white can usually do lands. Why not just yeah. everything? It's nine CMC. It literally could say... Bring all permanents from your graveyard, put them on the battlefield. Well, white can literally blow up every single permanent yeah. for this amount of mana, too, I think. So, uh, I think, like, if you're a Super Friends deck and you have the ramp, this is interesting. But, again, keep in mind that you need to be heavily in white or more in white because you have to pay the white, white, white of the mana cost. Uh, yeah, the, the Super Friends part, I think, is the most interesting part because we have spells that kind of do this all thing. your enchantments or all your artifacts. And they're cheaper. And most decks... yeah. Most decks like only want one of these things, really, when you think about it, right? Do you know a lot of decks that are running an even amount of artifacts, enchantments, and planeswalkers? Usually... Unless you're so mega about putting cards in your graveyard, no. Yeah. I mean, most decks are like, this is an artifact deck. This is an enchantment deck, right? And so you only really want to get back one of those things. The other one's just kind of gravy. This is a Super Friends deck. Although Super Friends deck, I'll admit, usually don't have the density of artifacts or enchantments that an artifact or enchantment deck, right? You don't you yeah. don't see a lot of decks with 30 Planeswalkers. They're usually more like 15 to 17 if they're Super Friends because you need so much support. But I mean, this to me reads Return Doubling Season and, the, and your Planeswalkers, yeah. right? Because that, that's the thing that's going to enter your graveyard most likely. And that's like a good setup. I just think there are like... I don't think this card is very good because I think there are a lot of substitutes for this effect that basically work in the same way, right? If you want to get your Planeswalkers back, Command the Dreadhorde is probably going to be better yeah. than this card because it costs three less mana. Although you're right, it won't simultaneously get back doubling season, but... <laughs> and you'll lose maybe a lot of life, but it also searches other people's graveyards as well. Um, there's Primeval's Glorious Rebirth, there's Replenish, which unfortunately is a really expensive card price-wise. Yeah. So I'm glad that Triumph and Reckoning does exist. I think you just need to really be careful, right? You can't just jam it into any deck. You need to think, is this going to create the result I want? Because at some point, if it's nine mana, bring back two things... Yeah, it's not that's not great. Um, maybe it's like twelve mana and cards for nine mana, so you, you can think about it that way too. But I think unless you're able to ramp up to this, or you're putting stuff into the graveyard, or you're playing Super Friends deck, this is going to be a hard thing to run. Well, that's the thing in a ramp deck, this is not great because you actually casting it on turn five. Right, all you've done great. is ramp, 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 and the cast this. It'll probably do nothing. So you also need to be in a self mill deck. In fact, this is probably better in a self mill deck than in a ramp deck if you had to choose one or the other. Yeah, yeah. It just it's hard for me to see like a real good home for this card. I just don't think it's good. I don't think you're playing this in mono white e either ever. Yeah, because you can't self mill much, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Unless well. you're grindstoning yourself to oblivion. Can you even grindstone yourself? Uh, <laughs> Millstone yourself, you Millstone, can. There you There's go, Ms. Miracle Orb. There's stuff. There might, you know, like a Teshar deck or something is maybe milling itself to get stuff in the graveyard because it can bring those back. I think there are niche uses for it. I just don't think some of these other ones are going to be more like, hey, you could just kind of put this in that colors deck and it'll be fine, even if it's not amazing. This yeah. one is way more narrow. But for the reasons we listed, that's why you put them in. Okay, next up, Mnemonic Deluge. All right, this is the blue one. Six blue, blue, blue for a sorcery. Exile target instant or sorcery card from a graveyard. Mm. A graveyard. Copy that card three times. You may cast the copies without paying their mana costs. And then you exile Mnemonic Deluge. 
So you get three copies of a spell that's in a graveyard. Probably yeah. yours. I mean, because you're not putting this in a deck unless you have a number of instants or sorceries that you would want to triple. And that's likely at that point to win you the game. Yeah. And looking at this card on its face just feels better in blue decks because it typically do have a lot of instants and sorceries. Blue, red decks just off the top of my head. You can play decks like Jaleva that can reduce your cheap in the cost. Uh, if you go Narset as well can cast this and then boom, you time warp three times. You know, Three extra combats, three more triggers on Narset. That's going to end the game. Yeah. Galvanoth is a red spell. It's sort of a sleeper hit. It's a red creature for three red red. At the beginning of your upkeep, you may look at the top card of your library and you can cast it without paying its mana cost if it's an instant or sorcery spell so i think you want to cheat this cheat this out or reduce the mana cost with like a mizix of the is magnus type thing um a card i think a lot of people are sleeping on is omni spell adept mm. which is a five mana creature it's a bit much but for two in the blue and tap it you can cast an instant or sorcery from your hand without paying his mana cost and looking at the five nine cmc sorcerers in front of me seems like that's an effect that is going to be a little more pertinent yeah i think in blue two blue is one of the mill colors more likely to fill up its graveyard. Incense and sorceries put themselves in the graveyard after you use them. Yeah. Whereas uh, in opposition of uh, the white one, Triumphant Reckoning, like artifacts, enchantments, and planeswalkers usually have to get to the graveyard in some other way. Mnemonic Deluge is the floor of it is actually, I think, pretty high. Like when you cast it, it's unlikely to be very, very bad, right? Like you would have... Yes, of course, you could have nothing in your graveyard, but that's unlikely to happen. Let's mm -hmm. say even just like a something weird, like a Mystic Confluence is in there. That's not going to be that bad. Like, that's going to be nuts. Bounce a bunch me? of things. Three Mystic Confluences. Yeah, you bounce a bunch of things, cards. dry a ton of cards. Like, yeah. yeah. Like, it's not going to... And that's like a really, really, really mediocre to bad scenario. If you have an extra turn spell in your graveyard, you just probably won the game. If you have Expropriate in yeah. your graveyard. So um, there's just a lot of cards that could be in there that are going to have a huge effect when you triple them. And that's not even counting the fact that just incidentally your opponents can also give you the fodder to use with this so yeah i would say like 20 percent of the time you should rely on your opponents but the majority should definitely be yours um it's funny if you cast this on living death because what happens is it just what? living deaths everything three times so it just does what do you end up with what you had or what you didn't have i think you end up with what you didn't have so because it, it you first you exile all the cards in your graveyard then you sack that's the one. creatures and that's one and then back you, you two. need two and then back, back is, is three, three. Oh, okay yeah. So it's just like casting Living Death once. Yeah, but you get Aristocrats triggers, uh, you know, or you get Perforos uh, triggers, yeah. or whatever it is. Um, I also actually kind of like this card, because if you're a deck that has, like, big 9 CMC finishers, and you work with your graveyard, then this is almost like a double of a spell in your deck, but it's better because it triples it. So Army of the Damned, which makes a ton of zombies, and it wants to be in your graveyard. Peer into the Abyss, which makes someone draw half the cards in their library and then lose half their life. You do that three times, you're going to pretty much get some of the killing range um rise of the dark realms you know you don't need to cast it three times you just need to cast it once but if it's in your graveyard then the mock deluge functions as another version of it yeah. right and then of course expropriate or extra, extra turns all that stuff yeah and and blue being one of the loot colors is also very very good too right. right because not only because you can put things in your graveyard but also because if mnemonic deluge is in your opening hand you could loot it away as a nine man spell that you can't cast forever so yeah like a nine cmc spell is a lot easier to store a stomach in a blue deck than it is in a white deck because you just have a lot more ways to be like okay i'll turn this into a different card in my deck by a loot effect that's on my jace friends prodigy prodigy or something like that so oh uh, yeah no. yeah so i think this card is just inherently better than the white one and one of the better ones in this series and blue has a lot of ways of making instances and sorceries cost less or copying them you know or what about them, copying yeah. this card when you cast it forking mm -hmm. it in some way you've got a, a the Ral planeswalker or whatever out yeah. and you go okay i'm gonna triple that one and triple this one over here yeah 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 okay. i mean even well, think, about, like, think about this too like nine mana what if you just cast this in the kodama's reach yeah like right three kodama's reaches for nine mana isn't the worst thing in the world now, obviously you'd rather win the game but at least it is better than trying from reckoning and you don't have, you have anything nothing. in your graveyard yeah, yeah. Um, don't do it on a Kodama's Reach, though. Just wait. <laughs> I mean, yeah. They, they definitely don't do it on a Kodama's Reach. Unless you are, like, really jealous about that ramp. <laughs> Which I often am, yeah. to be fair. <laughs> if you're not, if you're like, wow, you played two mana and you got, that's what happened for two mana? Wow, that's crazy. All right, next up is the red one. It is Soul Fire Eruption. Wait. Yeah, we, we skipped the red. I was going to do black first. but Oh, we yeah, Wu Berg. Wu -berg. That's okay. We're no, out now we're going, people we're, are really we're bad big. right now. We're big. <laughs> so far, eruption is six red, red, red for a sorcery. Choose any number of target creatures, planeswalkers, and or players. For each of them, exile the top card of your library. Then, so far, eruption deals damage equal to that card's converted mass cost, mana cost to that permanent or player. And you may play the exiled cards until the end of your next turn. Okay, let's walk through this really quick. So, okay, 
You choose targets. Let's just have me, me and Josh a one-on-one commander game. Okay. Just to make it easy? Yeah, just to make it easy. So you choose me, all my creatures can hit Planeswalkers too? Uh, yes, Planeswalkers and our players. Okay, so anything I, of that that I have, you choose every one of them, right? Yeah, so let's say you have two creatures, one Planeswalker and you, and then I also have one creature that I want to target for some, maybe it's a yeah, Brash Taunter care. or something. Yeah, you don't care. Yeah. Yeah, okay, so, so now choose... you're going to flip five cards off the top of your library, one for each of those permanents. Yes. And, and for me. And you start with turn order, so it starts on my turn. You can even choose yourself just for the card. Right, We'll, we'll talk about that in a second. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, and so you, I, I look at my board, I go, okay, that's a Brash Taunter, I'm going to flip the top card of my library, it's a land. Darn, does zero, zero damage. damage. Yeah, but I put that out of the site because yeah. I can play it next until my next turn. So and this then, is a weird combination of impulsive draw and sort of randomized direct damage, right? Yeah. So like, let's say I have a Planeswalker that's at four loyalty. You'd be like, I hope if I flip a four or more CMC spell Correct. for that one. And then you, you say you do, and then you flip t- for my creatures, and one maybe one of them takes three damage, the other takes two, and it only kills one of them. And then you flip it for me. Yeah, and, and that's dang, a, that was a five CMC spell. Right, yeah. so I take so Josh takes five damage. But all the cards that got flipped, now Jimmy exiles those, and he can play them until the end of his next, next turn. turn. Yeah, so it's like drawing them for the next turn. Uh, and because this costs so much mana, that makes a lot of sense. So when it goes... To, so after I choose my targets, I go to your board, and you have five, four targets. I choose the order that they will go in, and then I start flipping the cards. Maybe matters if you got a scroll rack or a scroll rack or a course top crew fix anything that if you oh, sh- then you could really like oh i know i have two lands on top i'm gonna choose my two things yeah and then right like you know right so mm-hmm. but the difference is is that if let's say you have 10 things and i can and i look at the top of my deck it's a five cmc spell i'm like well i know i have to use this one on that one but i can't so I gotta- flip it and then choose the next target i have to choose all the targets so it's best if it's like it's I'm only choosing one creature and you, let's say, so that I have a choice. All right, I need to kill the creature. The top card's a land. Okay, I'll go Josh first, then the creature. Because you you can't necessarily tell what the second card is unless you're using like a scroll rack or a sensei's divining top. In which case, you maybe just roll the dice and I'll choose your other creature. But then you do this for each player too. So it's like there's seven total creatures out, three other players. That's 10 cards I'm going to flip even if I'm not targeting my own stuff. Which means 10 cards I'm going to have access to to play until my next turn. You could still play a land off of it this Mm -hmm. turn and get the land out of it next turn. The card draw aspect of it is pretty interesting. Um, they also all target individually, so a will breaker comes into play here too, yeah. right? Uh, or so, Torbrand, Torbrand, or a yeah. Fiery Emancipation. Yep. All the damage increasers will work with this. Yeah, this is like a nutty card to play with Neheb because you're going to generate a ton of <laughs> oh, mana yeah. and guarantee do da- or potentially do damage to three opponents directly, and as you can well cast as clear. the spells now because you got the mana. Yeah, that's cool. Um, Neheb the Eternal is really good. You wrote down Mana Geyser, which is just like, yup, make a lot of mana, cast this thing, go nuts, right? Yeah, because a lot of times with Mana Geyser, you get 25 mana, and you're like, well, with nine of it, I'm going to do this, and then whatever cards I exile, I'm going to get to cast because I have all this yep. mana. Yeah. Oh, uh, oh, bosh. <laughs> oh, bosh, yeah. <laughs> there's, a, <laughs> there's a nine CMC spell. That seems like one of the best cards to put on Obosh. Again, provided you can get to that mana cost. Yep. This feels like everything that new red, is what I'm calling it, is in Magic, which is a, a bunch of direct damage, a bunch of impulsive draw, and but like it's randomized in some way yeah it's a little bit randomized it's it's not fully like you're in control it's a fun card i don't think it's extremely powerful because you don't know the outcome so it's very possible to cast this card and it doesn't actually do much so you spend nine mana don't yeah. kill the important things you know do a little damage to some players and then yeah you have those cards that you have access to but then that's your entire turn that just happened and generally you don't want to take it to a you know a turn where you cast something for nine mana and you don't know what the outcome is going to be. And you make everyone very upset at you as you kind of board wipe, kind of hit everyone in the face. And you look scary. They can see all the cards, right? <laughs> right they right, get to right. see every single one of the cards that you've got. So it's like, well, I hope I make it to my next turn and get to cast all these cards that they're staring at going like, boy, I hope he doesn't get that card. Forge, hopefully you're getting rid of the creatures that would kill you or maybe even a player. Um, you've got lands in your deck, right? Like so you're going to miss some of them. Yeah, I think the bit, the best thing is a scroll rack with this, though, because you're able to just like be like, all right, I have a six, five, and a four, or I'm going to go in this order and do it like that. So maybe the decks that already have top deck manipulation and are in red would consider this, because I, I think you need like Sensei's top and a few others in there to just at least guarantee I'm going to kill, you know, because it's a much better. I'm going to spend nine mana. I don't know what everything's going to do, but I know I'm going to kill those two most important things. Right. Or I, I'm going to dome someone for 10 and then put them within striking range of, a, of an attack this turn or something. Fun card, though, could lead to a lot of uh, anticipation, a lot of like, yeah. oh, boy, what happens? Flip. Oh, like those Imagine, are fun moments. Like those, <laughs> it's worth playing cards for that reason. I, someone like goes infinite with Kiki Jiki, makes a million copies. And you're like, so far eruption, targeting everything. <laughs> 
<laughs> you're gonna you're gonna bill yourself out though, right? Yeah, maybe. But at the very <laughs> least, I mean, find a way. It's to a very Jimmy deck. play. But at least you have, you know, it'd be fun because you can again make infinite targets, and yeah. then at a certain point, you can't exile cards. You will break it, steals everything. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. All right, cool card. I like the design on it. All right, the next one is the black one. It's Profane Transfusion. Six black, black, black for a sorcery. Two target players exchange life totals. You create an XX colorless artifact creature token where X is the difference between those two players' life totals. So if I'm in a game with Jimmy and Mel, and Mel's at 11 and Jimmy's at 20, and I, mm-hmm. for whatever reason I want to switch their two life totals, I'll make a 9-9. Nine, nine. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then I drop to 11, Mel goes to 20. Also, it could be me that's at like three and right. Jimmy's at 30 and we switch the two and I get a 27-27 <laughs> because it's two target players. You can choose, choose yourself. Yeah, I actually like this card a lot. There's a lot. It's funny that you make the thing that can then potentially kill, kill the them. thing. Yeah, <laughs> kill the one person that just got their life switched. Um, there is sort of a building theme of the, I call it the tree of redemption dot deck or the life swapper deck. So tree of redemption is a tree that taps and you can exchange your life total with its toughness, which is 11 or 13. And then there are cards like Evra, Halcyon Witness, which you can pay four to exchange your life total with Evra, and she has lifelink. But with a card like Profane Transfusion, it's like, I'm going to make my life really low. Switch to the life Switch total. Switch to life totals, and I'm in business. Um, Tainted Remedy is an enchantment. If an opponent would gain life, that player loses that much life instead. Uh, so you're just like making everyone get really low, and then you're like, all right, let's switch these two, sort mm-hmm. of do that sort of stuff. Uh, Phyrexian on life is pretty fun because it's an enchantment. You don't lose the game for having zero or less life. So you could get yourself to zero and then switch, switch your life total with someone and insta kill them. Oh yeah, or one of those cards that says you can't lose the game or whatever. Yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. Get your life to like negative four and then switch it. Yeah. <laughs> I like that. Uh, Lich's Mirror is like this artifact that if you lose the game, you instead shuffle your hand, the graveyard, and all permanents you own into your library, draw seven cards, and your life total becomes 20. So that's another thing where you're like, you are you know you're going to die or something and you're okay. Or, or someone, you know, maybe you get a low life total and then you kill yourself and then you're able to reset and get up to 20. You know, it's mm-hmm. an interesting... There's a lot of interesting things to do here. I think if you wanted to play this deck, it it was it would be pretty funny. <laughs> and black has a lot of ways to just kind of like pay life for things too. So Necropotence is a really good way to just oh, like, yeah. I have this card in my hand and I have Necropotence out. Okay, well, I'm just going to draw, yeah. you know, 39 cards and then switch to the life totals. Ad nauseum is a really, really too powerful black card that a lot of people use. So you can get yourself really low and then Profane yeah. Transfusion. Yeah. Uh, and then Repay in Kind is this five black black sorcery. Each player's life total becomes the lowest life total among all players. So again, like if you're just messing with life totals, these are the kind of cards you're going to be looking for. And not a card that most decks are going to want. I don't think so. I mean, like it's cool that you make a giant construct horror thing, but it seems really conditional. Also, it's sorcery speed. So you have to play it on your turn unless you have a way to flash it out. And the the setting needs to be pretty good. But and it's nine mana, you and it could doesn't even s- kill a player most of the time. Could make someone's day. I could see myself playing this because I'm so often just, just abusing my life people. total super low, and I could just give that to someone else. Like, that that kind of could swing a game, right? Someone's at infinite life because they're playing a life gain deck. Boom, switch your life total with someone else's, and then... Sure, but it's not a situation that you know that comes up in very many yeah, games, and yeah, you don't yeah, know yeah. which ones. Like I'm thinking of my Greven deck, which is probably the best deck to take advantage of this. Right, it's paying its own life total mm-hmm. all the time, and I'm not going to play this card in Greven because it's nine mana. Yeah, nine mana. Yeah, it's a tough one. Yeah, um, is if you're going to run it with a commander, Sangir the Dark Baron is all about having people mm-hmm. lose the game and then you're gaining life uh, equal to their life total as the turn began. So if you're at forty, Mel's at two. I switch your life totals, kill you, and then I gain forty life. Because that's what your life total was at when the game began. Lysia Sanguine Tribute. And then, yeah, I think that's like sort of like the, that's about it. It's not fantastic. It's more fun. It's kind of meme if anything. All right. Next one. The All last right. one. The, well, green the last one. one. The green one. Is uh, it the most powerful? Let's take bets on whether it's the most powerful before, you know, we already know. We already read the cards. So yeah. We can't do that. But you out there should guess if you think it's, yes, hint, it probably is. Okay. It probably is. Okay. It's reshape the earth. Six green, green, green for a sorcery. Search your library for up to 10 land cards. Put them onto the battlefield tapped, then shuffle your library. Nine mana, get ten lands. Whoa. The <laughs> thing about this card is no setup required. Yeah, and it's in It's green. just going to do the thing. Also, it's lands, right? It's not even basic lands. Yeah, just lands. It's just lands. Yeah, they come in tapped. But, like, you know what it's going to do when you cast it. Whereas Triumphant Reckoning, Soul, Soul Fire Eruption, Eruption, Profane Transfusion, even Demonic Deluge... Each and every one of them requires some kind of setup or there's some kind of randomness baked in. Mm -hmm. This card is like, nope, 
you pay nine mana, you're going to get 10 lands into play. I mean, it's not surprising that green is the strongest and then blue is right there in second place. Yeah, it's not surprising. It, it shouldn't be that way. You would hope that they would be trying to pump up the weaker colors, but that just seems to be the way that we always go. All right, let's talk about what you can do with Reshape the Earth, though, too, because I think just getting 10 lands into play is, you know, while not necessarily immediately game winning likely on if you untap after that you're probably going to win because just having 20 mana will often win you games but it's, it's not guaranteed but you do know what it's going to do but then of course if you build your deck in certain ways you can turn this into a win yeah and this is a card that you're not afraid to ramp out to as well if yep. you're on nine mana turn oh, five great. And cast this oh my gosh the earlier you can cast this the better yeah, yeah if you absolutely. could somehow ramp into this on turn five your turn six is going to be insane <laughs> because you're going to be 10 turns ahead of the other players and 10 lands so you can play a maze's end and potentially just win the game on the spot because of all the gates that you can grab with this yeah it can grab all the gates you need to hit 10 gates and win the game with maze's end yeah you just get all by itself and if you're a landfall trigger deck a scoot swarm you're making probably like a thousand of scoot swarms at that point it is like a thousand and twenty four i believe yeah field of the dead you're making a ton of zombies uh you can just get thespian stage dark depths you can get your oh yeah you can get utility stuff but you box a good one scavenger yeah. grounds just if your problem is like, oh, I need some Get your Urbor Cabal Coffers, right? There's just tons of things that you can do here. You can get your Valakuts. Valakut and, and nine stuff. mountains will usually kill someone. Yeah, yeah. You can get a Lotus Cobra uh, in the battlefield. If your Lotus Cobra's on the battlefield, you gain the mana right back. Lotus Cobra's so good with this. You just get 10 mana for spending nine mana. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> rough. Um, a lot of people were saying Archelos Lagoon Mystic would be really good because when Archelos is untapped, other permanents enter the battlefield untapped. So, so you spend nine mana, you get 10 mana back. It's just, again, Reshape the Earth is free. Yeah. Reshape the Earth. 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 Omnath, Locus of Rage, because you'll get 10 elementals. And if you have a sack outlet, that's 30 damage to somebody. Oh, I like this one. Felidar Retreat seems really, really good because put 10 one one counters on all my creatures or make some cats and put some amount of counters on everything seems pretty good. Yeah, you could make five cats and then put five counters on them. I mean, it's hard to imagine you have a landfall deck and you have any amount of landfall triggers out and you cast this and it doesn't win, right? Because just that's the way landfall triggers. Like Rampaging Baylos, I don't know, make 10 four fours. Like the, yes, they can board wipe and everything, but this is very, very powerful in those decks. And we know... Those decks are extremely prevalent because of Zendikar Rising recently, and mm -hmm. I even did that poll that found that like 40% of all players or whatever it is has a landfall Whoa. deck. So it's just a very popular strategy. Reshape the Earth is the one of these we're going to see the most, for sure. For sure. Yeah. Um, I hope I see Soulfire Eruption the most, but I know that's not going to happen. I hope I see it, but I don't want to see it all the time because it's going to take a while. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be fun, though. Uh, okay, so, well, here's the question I want to ask at the end of all of these cycles. So for the, f the um, huge sorcery cycle... Who got the best one, Jimmy? Green. Yeah. That one's not even a debate. I think green got the best one. I think you're right. I think blue There's got the second no best. There's no setup required, but you can cast it. It goes into your library. You're not looking into a graveyard. Your, your library is a consistent factor in every game. Yeah. I think red got the third best one. Yep. And then probably a tie between white and black, although I'm, white might somewhat edge it out just because yeah. I think like in some decks, this will just win the game on the spot if you do this. My guess is the black one is just a card we will basically never see played. It's yeah. just, it reads cool, but it's just, it's too hard to know what games that that's going to matter or be something you want to. Unless, unless your somebody builds that, that deck. deck. That, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I haven't really seen that deck yet. I think you, I agree that, that those pieces have slowly been coming to us and it's kind of like the stop hitting yourself deck where I think right. that strategy over time. over time might get there, but it's just not, doesn't have enough pieces quite yet. Yeah. All right, let's go on to the next cycle. It's the hero's will cycle. So all, I believe these are all the mythic partners. Yep. Each Akrama, have, Sakashima, Sazat, Jessica, and Kamal. So each of them have a, um, is, are they all instants? No, some are sorceries. Each of them have like a, a spell though that's tied to them. So the first one is the white one. It's called Akroma's Will. This is a good card. Three and a white for an instant. Choose one, but if you control a commander as you cast this spell, you may choose both. I like that as you cast. So they can't kill your commander in response. In response. Right. If your commander's out and you cast this, you're going to get both things. But if your commander's not out, you only get one. So the two things are creatures you control gain flying, vigilance, and double strike until end of turn. Hmm. That's option one. Option two is creatures you control gain lifelink, indestructible, and protection from all colors until end of turn. Whoa. So if you have your commander out, this is, you, you kind of put this in the notes, this is like a, a one-turn Akroma's Memorial. Right. Except it gives protection from all colors. Instead of black and red, yeah. Yeah. And it gives indestructible, which Chromus Memorial doesn't, right? No, I don't think so. But anyway, it's very similar. Lifelink, double strike, flying, vigilance. It's going to... This is a overrun type of effect. Mm -hmm. um, 
it instant speed too. So yeah, giving the creatures indestructible, you could just use this as a heroic intervention to yeah. stop things from getting blown up. I really like that dual that duality to it. It can be used as a my board's big and now I'm gonna use this to win. It mm-hmm. can also be used as a more my board's big and I'm gonna use this to protect it. Yeah. I think if you're in a deck that can win if you play a Chromus Memorial and just swing out, then this is it just absurdly an auto include because it's the same thing, right? Four mana at instant speed and it works in terms of like if you need to protect and block a bunch and gain a bunch of life. So there are a lot of instances here where Chromus Will is just gonna be handy. Um and four mana is not super cheap, but it's cheap enough, I think, to to get the nod of like, hey, this is a good card. Yeah, I, I think, you know, Heroic Intervention, like you mentioned, is a card that just goes in all the decks that are trying to go wide. Yeah. And this is a go wide also uh, card in that if your your board is wide, this will punch through the extra damage you need. But Heroic Intervention is a card that only protects your board in that mm-hmm. situation. And this will couldn't do both. Again, more mana, less efficient. Uh, it, but still, I think this is going to... We're going to see this card a lot. Yeah, this is definitely a big finisher type card. Uh, and I think, like you said, the, the modal part of this is really nice. You know, Return of the Wild Speaker is also an amazing card. It's an instant speed that lets you draw or overrun. This is one that's a protect or an overrun. So we're getting a lot of pieces to make that sort of happen. So token token decks, this feels really, really good. I think extra combat steps, this is really, really good. Any yeah. deck that's getting extra combats is going to really take advantage of the fact that, you know, you get flying double strike, lifelink, indestructible, just swing in, swing in, swing in. Yeah, just keep uh, swinging. Morag works really, really good. This actually works good with Morag, even if you don't read Morag correctly, because it gives vigilance. <laughs> so you don't have to worry about the untap part. The untapping part? Yeah. yeah. That's hilarious. <laughs> Play it before combat and before you go to attacks if you want the vigilance parts to matter. Okay. All right. Moving onwards, we got uh, Sakashima's Will. So this is from Sakashima, obviously. Three in the blue for a sorcery. Choose one. If you control commander as you cast a spell, you may choose both. Target opponent ga- chooses a creature they control. You gain control of it. Or choose a creature you control. Each other creature you control becomes a copy of that creature until end of turn. It's kind of weird, that first tech. It's, it, it's from uh, Preacher, I think, which is a white card. That yeah. they choose. They which, choose the creature you gain control of. Yeah, that second part. Obviously, if they give you a crappy creature, at least you can turn it into whatever your best creature is. You're gonna right. turn all your creatures into your best creature, probably, unless it's legendary. Yeah, which is in effect called like it's like mirror weave, which is similar, uh, except mirror weave classifies non legendary. So if you have Sakashima out, this means you can make all your creatures legendary. If you're playing against a Voltron deck and they only have one creature out, oh, because you make a copy of Sakashima. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Or Sakashima's on your board, and then you can copy something. Or actually, yeah, yeah, Sakashima would have to get copied, I think. Okay, well. That's a legend rule. Anyway, the card that I thought would be really fun would be Mirror Mad Phantasm. Is you have this on your side of the board. It's three blue blue for a 5-1 flyer. And you can pay one in the blue to have its owner shuffle it into their library. If that player does, they reveal cards from the top of their library until a card named Mirror Mad Phantasm is revealed. And that, that player puts that card on the battlefield and all their cards revealed into their graveyard. So you steal someone's creature. You make it all a copy of Mirror Mad Phantasm. You pay one in the blue on the creature you stole from them. And it's the the owner of the card, right? They get it. They shuffle it, but they don't have Mirror Mad Phantasm. They just immediately mill out. <laughs> <laughs> so it's kind of rude. <laughs> Because it says it's very yeah, specifically yeah. Mirror Mad Phantasm's owner, not yeah. controller. That's and cool. it, because it's Mirror Mad Phantasm when it gets copied. Okay. Uh, you probably play this in the Brew the Clad deck because yep. you're already looking to copy all of your creatures into a thing. Pathbreaker Ibex seems a lot of fun because you just make a bunch of Pathbreaker goats. Ibex. Yeah, and they all get plus three, plus th- or plus X, plus X whenever they attack. Uh, <laughs> Biovisionary. That's the one. Yeah, yeah, I think that's the one everybody mentioned in regards to this card because you turn all your creatures into a biovisionaries, and it's very hard if you have a biovisionary and you steal somebody else's creature for you not to have at least four four of them, right? Like yeah. that's gonna happen probably. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. But make biovisionary and just win the game. That's the one where you win the game if you have four of them. Yeah, which is very hard to do otherwise. All right, next up we got Sazat's will. Sazat. Four in the black for an instant. Choose one. If you control commander as you cast a spell, you may choose both. Each opponent sacrifices a creature they control with the greatest power and exile all cards from all opponents' graveyards, then create X-01 black throw creature tokens where X is the greatest power among creature cards exiled this way. I'm unimpressed. I think it's actually okay. I wish it costs less. I think that's the problem. Five mana Mm. is pretty hefty. These effects are both fine, and I think actually the graveyard hate effect. Exile all cards from all opponents' graveyards at instant speed, and then incidentally, you 
create a zero one black thrall creature token where or X many, is the greatest power yeah. among creature cards that got exiled this way. That's incidental, and you'll probably use it in black decks because you want to sacrifice stuff, turn them into mana, whatever. But man, you can hose a lot of people that do a lot of things to get their graveyard full. Somebody goes to Triumphant Reckoning, and you're like, boom, exile all cards from all graveyards. Somebody goes yeah. to Mnemonic Deluge, boom, exile all cards from all graveyards. How many times has this happened? You're playing against the Modrotho deck. We saw it in extra turns recently, the Around Me deck. You know, Lady Ice that win by just going Bojuka Bog. There goes your graveyard. And instant speed's even worse because they think they're doing something, and then they're not. Living Death, boom. Nope. Yeah, that does, it does hose a lot of stuff. The instant speed on this has to be the best part. I don't really care about the edict, the triple edict, because it doesn't seem like it sometimes will just be a dud. But sometimes it will do stuff, and I think that's fine if that's not the only thing the card does. Yeah, true. Because the fact that, like, because often that is useful, right? Each opponent sacrifices a creature they control with the greatest power. Often you'll look at a board and be like, that's going to kill the two best things out there. Even if it kills the one best thing and gets rid of two, like, okay things, I, I guess that's not At so instant speed either. on your end step, too, so you're not over, um, you're not overexerted as far as, like... Mana. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that can be good uh, five mana is a lot to hold open though and that's the big problem here i think if this thing costs three probably too powerful four four i think it sits in a better space five is just hard to keep that amount of mana open so i think this goes in decks that are already planning to leave five mana open most of the time so these uh, instant speed cast spells on your other opponent's turns matter decks that we're starting to see more and more of flash tribal decks that kind of thing i think this card probably deserves a spot as like a really a really uh targeted silver bullet against certain decks and then still has utility when you're not playing against those decks but let's be honest how often anymore are you in a pod where no one's messing around with their graveyard? Yeah, almost always there's at least one player. So and if you're playing Bajuka Bog already, then this seems like one that you could definitely run. And most cards that exile all cards from all players' graveyards do it from all players' graveyards. And that kind of sucks because a lot of times you're also playing with your graveyard. Mm -hmm. This is opponent's graveyards. So I think this is a little better than it looks. I don't like the mana cost, but I could see myself playing it in certain decks that are already looking to hold their mana open. Yeah, and definitely look for your meta. If everyone's doing messy graveyard things and you're like, man, they're just completely dominating the game because of that. Well, Sazat's Will will help put a damper in those plans. All right, the next one is the red one. Spoiler alert. Probably the best one, right? Yeah, probably. It's pretty sweet. All it's right. three mana. The first time I read it, I did not think it was. But yeah. the more I've heard about it and talked about it, the more I've been like, yeah, this card is legit. Jessica's Will, two to red for a sorcery. Choose one, but if you control a commander as you cast this spell, you may choose both. The first option is add a red mana to your mana pool for each card in target opponent's hand. Mm -hmm. And then the second choice is exile the top three cards of your library. You may play them this turn. Okay. Seems very innocuous. Yeah, right. It's kind of like, okay, it's got triple exile off the top, but you have to play them this turn. Red for each opponent's hand. Was I going to get you three, four mana? But at the end of the day, this is still a three mana that will potentially gain you extra mana and give you card advantage in the same turn. It's kind of what red's been needing at a low CMC cost. It's not like Soul Fire Eruption, which is nine mana to get a bunch of cards you can play. Just because Will often will give you the option if you have your commander out to exile a bunch of three cards and potentially play them because maybe someone has six cards in their hand and you gain mana off of this. Yeah, let me ask you a question. How often in commander games do you look around and every single one of your opponents is at three cards or less? Pretty, not not that often. I Almost say, never. Maybe there's like one player and it's the Boros player. But you just or, don't pick them. Yeah, exactly. Like all, for this to be bad... Actually, it still wouldn't be bad in that case, because let me just pitch you something here. What does Ancestral Recall do? One mana, draw three. Okay. This... Could be a is one mana... It's almost always going to be better than that. Because <laughs> you're getting more mana to play it with? It, you almost always net mana, right? Like, I, most games of Commander, one player's got at least five cards, mm -hmm. right? You almost never look around and everybody's three cards or less. And if everybody's two cards you cost you one mana it's ancestral recall again not the exact same obviously you have to play them this turn and so you can play them they're lands right yeah. they're lands you can play them but ancestral recall would allow you to hold a card in your hand and not mm -hmm. play it yet but then sometimes so ancestral recall the floor yeah right kind of the worst this card is gonna be obviously we're using some um some hyperbole here but you get what <laughs> i'm saying if that's the floor of the card think how good the card is because sometimes this card reads give you four mana draw three cards, give you six mana, draw three cards. 
Magic Christmas land give you like 20 mana if someone's going nuts with their hand size. Red also has like forks and things. Imagine that you fork reiterate. this card. If you have enough reiterate. to reiterate oh, over yeah. and over again, you know, just keep casting this over and over again, keep getting the buyback costs. Because gives you cost. the mana to reiterate. Yeah, so you exactly. Just look through your entire deck and then, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, the more you look at this card, this is in every red deck card, I believe. Yeah, I believe any mono red deck for sure, I almost think- every single red deck otherwise, unless it's like a five color deck and you don't really need it. Yeah, that's the part where you run into, well, if I get five red mana, that might not be that great if my my deck's five color. Yeah. Because I might not be able to cast most things with only red mana. But I think three colors or less, and you have red, you're probably... Like, you probably... This card will be good in your deck. Maybe it's not, like, the best card. all-star, but it's still always going to do work. This is a staple. This is a really good card. Yeah, uh, Vadrock Apex of Thunder is a Jeskai commander that when it mutates, you can cast a non-creature card with CMC3 or less, and you're going to have your commander as you cast it, so you get both parts. Nekusar is a way to make sure everyone has a ton of cards in their hand. All the wheel decks. All the wheel decks, yeah. So, seems pretty good. All the wheel decks, and there are a lot of them. CEDH is going nuts about this card, by the way. Yeah. Which tells you it's good. I'm happy for it. It's in red, so it's great, right? Yay! Yeah. If white had a card, well, white's is good though. I, I yeah, like white, white's, white's is white's good. Will, yeah, it's, it's not as good as Jessica's will, but it's good. All right, the last one is green. It's Kamal's will, three and a green for an instant. We saw this on game nights. Didn't actually get played though. Mm. Choose one. If you control a commander as you cast a spell, you may choose both. Option one: until end of turn, any number of target lands you control become one-one elemental creatures with vigilance, indestructible, and haste. They're still lands. All your lands become 1-1s one with indestructible vigilance and haste. Any number. So you actually don't need to choose oh, yeah. all of them. You could choose just two if you're... No reason to choose the like tapped that. ones, probably. Yeah, 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 yeah right. Uh, unless you wanted to be indestructible. We'll talk about that in a second. The second option is choose target creature you control. Or sorry, you don't control. Choose a creature you don't control. Each creature you control deals damage equal to its power to that creature. So that is kill a creature, right? It's a punch from a multiple creatures. Yeah. That um, might be also why you turn all of your lands into a 1-1. One, one. Just to have enough power to, to punch, punch out something, something big. Yeah. yeah. Uh, this in Game Nights, if you remember, spoiler alert, if you haven't watched the um, Commander Legends episode of Game Nights, it was a few weeks ago now, so if you haven't watched it, it's kind of your fault. If I'm, <laughs> you should pause this and go watch it, though. Uh, this is a card that Joe re- ends up revealing off the top of his library with some effect, and we all know he has it, and it's basically going to kill us because he has come all out which pumps all your creatures every combat yep and so we are in like oh if he casts that we die so we're you know i managed to wheel of fortune and get it out of his hand but this is that type of card turn your lands into creatures overrun type effect kill everyone yeah obviously kamal uh heart of cross is great with this because it gives your creatures plus three plus three and then there are cards that we mentioned with kamal in the set review which is sylvan awakening rude awakening natural affinity just making all of your lands into creatures Beastmaster um, master ascension yeah. yeah which is pretty good because all your lands get plus five plus five and their land so they're gonna be able to attack these um, is really good because you play it the turn before you're gonna kamal's will they don't know it and looking at your board they go He's only got two creatures. Yeah, how is he going to attack? Haha, turns out my lands can. Yeah. Uh, And then Sylvan Advocate, uh, as long as you control six or more lands, Sylvan Advocate and land creatures you control get plus two, plus two. Yowza. Yowza. That's three, three, haste, vigilance. uh, Vigilance, so you can still tap them afterwards. I like that. The worst thing you can do is play this and then play mass land destruction. Yeah, that's the the (laughs) other usage of the card, which is like, it makes your lands indestructible. Rough. So... Going um, Kamal's will into Armageddon is, you know, a thing. Just that, don't do that, though, please. In your play, it's it's all about your playgroup. If your playgroup is that kind of playgroup, it's totally fine. Just don't do that if your playgroup is not already doing things that are like that. Right. Right. If there's okay. not stack decks, stack <laughs> decks, and control decks running around, don't do that. Yeah. Don't be the one person that's like, look at this cool interaction. Everyone groans at you. Yeah. Um, okay. Which one was the best? I think Jessica's will is Hands because down, of easy. what red doesn't have and what it's giving. But honestly, a lot of these are pretty close. Um, I think a Grummer's will is probably second for me yeah it, it's an instant win on the spot type spell and it's doing what white wants to do it the protection is really really big i find my my white decks just will run to various protection heroic intervention you know they want they're not at a critical mass yet of those cards boros charm mm-hmm. that say hey my board's gonna be safe yeah and then i think the rest of them are pretty close i think sakashima's will and kamal's will are pretty good Sazat's will again is dependent if you have a lot of graveyards in your meta if you do then that card skyrockets in value i think yeah i think the blue and the black one are both a little bit behind i'd put them in last place maybe tied but they're still usable in many decks yeah, I think sakashima's are- will is weird because your opponent is giving you the creature yeah so you have all to right find ways to abuse it Let's go to the last cycle, which is the 
what did you call it here? The high courts. The high courts. You can see behind us, if you're watching the YouTube video, we've got the the red one, the, the court of view. ire behind us. That was uh, animated by Sam. So we're getting, about to be overrun by lava. Yeah. Doesn't uh, seem too fun. <laughs> so let's start with the white one instead. Court of Grace, where you're about to be overrun by, I don't know, angelic feels. Maybe maybe some choir singing. <laughs> so this is too white, white for an enchantment. When Court of Grace enters the battlefield, you become the monarch. And notably, this is the text on all of these. When this court enters the battlefield, you become the monarch. Okay. And the white one says, at the beginning of your upkeep, create a 1-1 one, one spirit white creature token with flying. If you're the monarch, create a 4-4 white angel creature token with flying instead. So when this comes down, this is essentially four mana draw a card because you are the monarch who will draw the card at the end of your turn. And if you keep the monarch around, as will be the text for the rest of these, then you get an additional bonus, but you still get an upkeep bonus regardless. Yeah, all the courts work the same way. Make you the monarch when they come into play. They have a thing they do, and that thing is just better if you're the monarch when they're doing the thing on your upkeep. Yeah. So this one is... Make a 1-1, one, one, but if you're the Monarch, make a 4-4 four, four flyer. Oh, sorry, 1-1 one, one flyer or a 4-4 four, four flyer. Yeah, and this one's pretty powerful in terms of that. I think White has good abilities to keep the Monarch because you have Norn's Annex and Ghostly Prison, which stops people from sort of smacking at you, which is nice. Um, but it's tough to keep the Monarch. That just seems like a very high order. Here's the thing. If you've played with Monarch much, and we have a lot because we like the... We like the mechanic and what it does for games, but you don't tend to hold the Monarch for long stretches in games. I know in the last game nights, um, Rachel held it for quite a while, but in, in most games, that's not the case. In most games, like you have it, you lose it before it's your turn again, you grab it again on your turn, you draw the card. So you are drawing the card off of it, but you're not actually untapping as the Monarch that often. Yeah. And in those games that you are, you're usually winning those games uh, because no one's able to attack you when they want to. So that's usually an indication that you're ahead, in which case you don't... I mean, it's good to get these bonuses, but that's not, you know... It's, yeah. not, it's not saving you when you're behind, which is what you want cards more to do. So uh, I think this card's like, fine. Yeah, the problem is that it makes a token and that token can't attack unless you have haste, but that token would be great at giving you back the monarch because it's a low flyer or blocking, yeah. It can probably take it back on the following turn, maybe. Maybe. It's a 1-1 one, one flyer, but... Yeah. At that point, though, it's four mana, but again, white is sort of starved for ways to draw cards, so I think if you're playing a deck that is a token deck or if you have Divine Visitation in your deck, so it doesn't matter what kind of token you get, they all become 4-4s. Four um, and there's like the Flying Tribal decks as well, like Kanji, Skywarden, Inez, Kaikar already makes Spear that and you can, can use sacrifice. The this mix. Yeah, so I, th I think this has limited usage. It's definitely not the strongest of the ones though, that we're going to talk about. I think you got to look at it and say, am I okay play playing a four man enchantment that says, you know, draw a card when it comes into play, make a 1 1 spirit every turn? Because that's going to be what it does 70% of the time or whatever, yeah, right? Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. I'm thinking about it and I think <laughs> the answer is no. Four is too much. Bitter Blossom only costs two. Come on. It doesn't yeah. draw your card though, does it? It's, it's like not in white either, mono yeah. white. So that again is another consideration as always. All right. The blue one is called Court of Cunning. One blue blue, so three mana for this one. It's an enchantment. When it enters the battlefield, you become the monarch. And it says, at the beginning of your upkeep, any number of target players each mills two cards. Hmm. If you're the monarch, each of those players mills ten cards instead. Whoa. So, Wait, so for dedicated mill decks, this sucks because you're not playing creatures to get the monarch back. <laughs> that's <laughs> right? a really good point. I don't think you're playing this in a deck that's trying to mill people out. Well, maybe. I mean, it's great for self-mill, right? Because you can just choose yourself each time and mill the cards or mill up to 10. Three-man enchantment that mills you for two every turn is not outside the realm of possibility. Yeah. And given that you may grab the Monarch like once or twice in a game, you're in blue, so maybe you've got an unblockable creature or something. Or flyers, yeah. But you're unlikely to keep it, probably. Um, yeah, it doesn't seem like it goes... The Monarch and mill just don't seem like those strategies mesh well, I agree. No, uh, but the nice thing is, is that it's target player. You can target yourself. So Aromi of the Death Tide, Dead Tide, which everyone saw in the last extra turns video, is just going off. This is the kind of card that you would put in there. Uh, I think in general, you want to have more ways to self mill, and it's tough. There are a lot of ways that don't seem that great. And Court of Cunning, if it can sometimes mill you up to ten, it's better than my Hermit Druid activation. <laughs> uh, Maldrotha, Scarab God, Sadisi. These are all cards that want to mill themselves. Yep. Uh, all commanders. Sir Conrad, which we have to mention at least once per episode. That's <laughs> actually obligated <laughs> yeah this sir conrad episode is brought to you by wizards <laughs> i guess <laughs> uh, sir conrad cares about creatures going into graveyards and this will do it for all players so that's pretty good uh, yep. paradox haze is a card that i think is good with all of these all right because it two in the blue for an enchantment enchant player at the beginning of enchant player's first upkeep that player gets an additional upkeep step so you get two upkeep triggers on anything but notably all the courts care about your upkeep especially right. if you are the monarch You'll mill 20 cards, you know, from however many players you want to. That could be pretty good. So, 
yeah, I don't think this is the best one. The, the, I, no. the white one, even though it's lackluster, I think is probably most of the time better than the, the Court of Cutting. Yeah, at the very least, white gives it the option to get your monarch back with right. a flyer. Court of Cutting cannot help you get the monarch. Like, yeah, it will actually, if anything, make players salty because people do not like mill in general, I found. Okay, we have three more courts to talk about, black, red, and green. Plus but, all the white cards and the red cards. Oh yeah, a lot left. But before we get to it, let's hear a quick message from our mid-roll sponsors. Bruce and Silas, Vice Cops. This episode, Undercover. Greetings, fellow criminals. Yes, it is a good day to do some uh, crimes, is it not? Crimes, eh? My boss, Krenko, could use some guys like you. Come on, I'll show you where his secret lair is. Wait, that smell. Oxen? Oxen? It's Bruce and Silas. Cheese it, boys. Bruce, we really need to do something about your hygiene. You should try Hawthorne, the premium tailored personal care brand. But I can't help how I smell. Sure you can. Hawthorne makes it easy to look and smell your best. You just take their quiz. Oh, is it a hard quiz? No, it's fun. They ask easy questions like how often you shower, what your hair type is. Rarely and bald. And then they send you high quality products perfect for upgrading your self care routine. My favorite was the ultra rich hand cream. Your hands are made of metal, though they do appear softer. Yet they feel softer. So do what I did. Take Hawthorne's quiz today Day and get started on your personalized self-care routine by going to hawthorne.co and use promo code command to get 10% off your first purchase. That's H-A-W-T-H-O-R-N-E dot C-O. Promo code command. Hawthorne.co, promo code command. And after that, I'll be a proper gentleman. Eh, I'd settle for you just not smelling like livestock. Being a spy for House Demir isn't only about sneaking around in the shadows. Field agents might think they're all that matters, but a good hacker can get more done with covert keyboard action than they could ever dream about. Gotcha, there's my target. Now that I've found an unsuspecting member of the Orzhov Syndicate, the next steps will be easy. All I have to do is access their data and clone their identity. Then I can use that fake ID to hack into the Syndicate mainframe, find out what the Ghost Council is up to, copy all of their info, and do really annoying stuff, like sell it to ad companies. Lazav's gonna be very Ooh. happy. What? ExpressVPN? No, 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 no! I can beat most VPNs no problem, but ExpressVPN, they're the best there is. They've got this technology called Trusted Server mm. that makes it impossible for servers to log a user's info. <laughs> Nobody told me the Orzhov had access to this level of tech. They've got ExpressVPN. I can't get in. I have to head to the safe house. Ugh, Lazov's gonna kill me! Hackers are out there. That's why we use ExpressVPN to safeguard our personal data online. And if you use expressvpn.com slash command right now, you can arm yourself with an extra three months of ExpressVPN for free. That's expressvpn.com slash command. Visit expressvpn.com slash command to learn more. Greetings, I am Nazan, revered bladesmith. Yes, that's my title, bladesmith, though you wouldn't know it. Seriously, I made one hammer and now it's all anyone talks about. That's why I'm here, to reforge my reputation as a blade expert and tell you about Harry's Razors, a company that deserves the endorsement of a revered bladesmith, which is exactly what I am. From their razor factory in Germany, Harry's hones only precision blades. They even source the steel themselves to keep their prices low. In fact, Harry's blades are so sharp that many guys have reported that their eighth shave is just as smooth as their first. I tried Harry's razors and was astounded by the clean feeling of the shave. That's a new experience for someone who is completely covered in hair. And now Harry's has a great offer for listeners of the command zone. New US customers can redeem a Harry's trial set at harrys.com slash command for just $3. You'll get a five blade razor featuring their new sharper blades, a weighted ergonomic handle, foaming shave gel with aloe, and a travel cover to protect your blade when you're on the go. Just go to harrys.com slash command and redeem your trial offer today. Now that's the sort of blades you can rely on. Seriously, try and shave with a hammer. I promise it won't go well. Welcome back. We Woo. are talking about the cards from Commander Legends that can go in your 99 that aren't commanders. Uh, we got the rest of the Court of series to cover them, the white cards and the red cards. Remember, this is only part one of our uh, of our two-episode series on this topic. You want more of us, you're going to get it. <laughs> it's been a lot of us lately, so thanks for sticking with us here. <laughs> thanks, yeah. Uh, even Happy I'm sick, sick of us at this point. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we did the white and the uh, blue Court of Series here, so we're going to go next to the black one, which is the Court of Ambition. I like all the names, by the way. I'm yeah. just going to say that. Like, Grace, Cunning, Ambition, Ire, Bounty. They're, they're nice and thematic. Yeah, this is cool. So, good job, that those people. 
cool. <laughs> All right. Court of Ambition, two black, black, four mana for an enchantment. When it enters the battlefield, you become the monarch. It says, at the beginning of your upkeep, each opponent loses three life unless they discard a card. Hmm. So they have the choice. Okay. If you're the monarch, instead, each opponent loses six life unless oh. they discard two cards. Whoa. I'm almost always going to be losing life unless I'm a discard deck or I like stuff in my graveyard with flashback or whatever. Yeah, this can help certain decks, of course. Yeah. Um, but it's a pretty steep cost if you're the monarch. Three life a card, everyone's going to take three. It's not going to matter too much. But they're not going to want to let you keep the monarch at all when you have this because six life and or two cards, Yeah, that hurts. That's going to be about a sixth of their life, right? If they're around, if they're at 36, yeah. that's, a, that's a lot. It, it, that actually does end up adding up. You play a deck, Josh, where people are losing three life and making a choice all the time, right? Uh, yes, Athreos. Yeah. This is, I don't think I'll put this in that deck, but it, three life matters. Often people do not want to take three. So six, I can even say being like, ooh, really don't want to do that. Yeah, and discarding two cards, like getting hemmed or getting, you know, uh, yeah. uh, whatever it is. That mind, happens to you twice and you might just be out of the game because you just don't have any gas. Yeah, so you're almost always losing the life here, I think. Um, unless, again, you're taking advantage of it. So a card that obviously goes well with this, again, go watch Extra Turns. Belby, Corrupted Observer. Uh, at the beginning of each player's pre-combat man phase, that player adds colorless for each of your opponents who lost life this turn. Puts them in a real bind, because if they take the life, which they want to do, even if you're not the monarch, then they're giving you effectively two mana each. Yeah. So you e pretty easily get the six mana for Belby, which... You can get very early in the game, and we saw Murph like put out scary stuff on turn three already because of Belby. Yeah, and it wasn't even the scariest thing he could have probably played, but it was still pretty darn nuts. Turn two worm or turn three worm coil or whatever. Yep. Um, losing life is important for decks like Rakdos, Lord of Riot, and in this case, it says creatures you cast cost one less to cast for each one life your opponents have lost this turn. So if everyone loses six life. That's, Nine mana. That, yeah, that you can't who, do it against Rakdos. If this is out, you have to discard the card. Yeah, and if everyone loses six life, that's what it's eighteen mana, right? They're just casting Eldrazi <laughs> after Eldrazi at that <laughs> yeah. point, which Rakdos that, is already looking to do, by the way. <laughs> discard synergy, maybe like yeah. waste not and things like that. This is not the best because they can choose, right? So I think like if they see waste not out, they're probably taking the damage, which they are sort of going to want to take anyway. I think this one's not that great ultimately because four mana. It really is going to make people want to take the Monarch. The, the table will team up to hit you right. because they don't want to have to discard the cards more than take the damage. And if you have those effects out that would work with the discard, they're going to choose the other one. So it's just hard to get it to work for you in the way that you want to. Yeah, I find discard just always being a really tricky space because one, people hate discarding cards, and two, there are people that can use that to their advantage. So right. you're just kind of double disadvantage there. You're going to lose some political sway, and some people are just going to win harder because of you. Yeah. So I, ultimately, I don't think this is a good card. No. But it's it's the weakest so far, I think. Yeah. All Which right. is fine. Black's fine. Yeah. They don't need it. All right. Red, though? We'll see. Court of Ire, also behind this. Three red red for an enchantment. When Court of Ire enters the battlefield, you become the monarch. At the beginning of your upkeep, Court of Ire deals two damage to any target. If you're the monarch, it deals seven damage to that player or permanent instead. Five mana. This is the most expensive one. <laughs> and you, like, I, I think with all of them, you just have to consider it as what it does when you're not the monarch most two of the time. Two damage to any target? It's just... I don't want to spend five mana. Wait till my next upkeep and what happened? I drew a card and then did two damage to something. Yeah, it's not great. Red already has problems in mono red get, you know, with ramp because they just have artifact based ramp and what's the chances you're going to... And, and if you're a burn deck, this doesn't give you monarch back because it's combat damage so this one actually kind of is a bummer to me you're just i mean the only decks that are going to want this i think obosh because it's odd torbrand because you're just doing a bunch of damage but i'm not I putting think, it in an obosh i think you just have better options yeah the this. problem with obosh is like that deck's not set up to stop people from attacking you so you're right. gonna just lose the monarch you'll never have it yeah on your upkeep and four damage is not that much better, and the Obosh has to be out. I'd just rather do something that they can't see coming like that. Yeah, there is a bit of a pain in the butt, which is like your opponents are not going to want to play their two toughness creatures with mm -hmm. this out, but I don't think it's worth the five mana slot. You could just play Mana Geyser and do something insane instead. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't think this is replacing Mana Geyser in your deck, though. Yeah, like, no, you know, no, of course not. <laughs> yeah, I don't think that one's very good. All right, the green one. What are the odds? The green one is the best one. Let's find out. It's two green green for an enchantment. Yes, yes, blah, blah, blah. ETBs, you become the monarch. And then it says, at the beginning of your upkeep, you may put a land card from your hand onto the battlefield. Oh, that's without being the monarch. So that's exploration, kind of. Okay, so what, you get like two lands if you're the monarch? 
If you are the monarch, instead, you may put a creature or land card from your hand onto the battlefield. <laughs> what? So why does this? Why is this by far not even close? This is by far the most powerful one. Yeah, this uh, just because the difference is huge. First of all, and also the front end is just I just think better, right? Like, would you rather deal two damage to something on your upkeep or put an extra land into play? Yeah. Would you rather make let a me, one, let one me ask this question another way? Or the land? <laughs> let me ask this question another way. How many decks do you have in the format that play shock in them? Oh. None. Yeah. How many play exploration? <laughs> All of, as yeah. many as you can. Yeah. As many as you can afford. Yeah. Like a four mana exploration, not great. Uh, four mana exploration that draws a card, right? Yeah. Not right. great, but still playable and fine, right? Because also green is one of the better colors at holding the monarch. Yes. I was going to say that. White and green. White because you can stop people. But green just, you have tokens and yeah. you have creatures. You have, you you have huge attack. stuff. They're like, I can't attack. My thing will just die. I have trample. Yeah. Yeah. So... The, and then the fact that the upside is literally more powerful than any of the upsides, right? Would, would you rather put a creature from your hand into play without paying for its mana, right? Just put it out. Or would you rather make a 4-4 four, four flyer? Uh, creature. Would you rather... Okay, I, what if the choice was creature or mill somebody for 10? <laughs> Clearly mill... No, just creature, come on. <laughs> creature or give all your opponents the choice to discard two cards or take six damage. Creature. Okay, creature or seven damage to a target. I love damage, but it's got to be a creature. Yeah, it's just the upside of that is too insane because you can get a freaking Nyx Bloom Ancient out into the battlefield for free. Yeah, you can get an Andrazi on the battlefield for free. I mean, this is, again, green has been cheating mana costs since uh, you know the beginning of time with Channel, and so Court of Bounty just adds on to that. Now, again, this kind of is a redundant effect. Maybe you already have a lot of ways of doing this. You're a Tooth and Nail type deck. You don't need Court of Bounty because four mana ramp one land at the beginning yeah. of your next upkeep isn't great. But this is still by far the most playable. If I had to recommend any player, if like a new player is here, like, hey, I want to play the courts, be like, just play the green one. The rest of them don't seem that great. Yeah, I think we got to be honest, right? The court of series, the entire series, they're not great cards. Yeah, they're they're definitely underpowered. <clears throat> they're not pushed, I think. They're in the five and six range decks. They're not going in the seven plus range decks, right? If you're trying to optimize your deck, I don't think there are very many decks that want the court of. So there's a few probably in there. Well, uh, Monarch has this wonderful ability to just kind of balance the game to be a little bit more on the interactive fun side. Yeah. So you, it, it doesn't give you a guarantee. Like tooth and nail, if you resolve that, you're you know getting the cards. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I did want to say, I think all of the court ofs get a lot better if you're playing two cards, can you guess what those cards might be? Or cards like this. Cards. Uh, flash enablers. Yep. Vidalcan <laughs> Ori, Leyline of Anticipation. Think of how good Court of Bounty is if you flashed it on the end step before your turn because you yeah. become the monarch and now it's your upkeep and you're the monarch and you go, oh, yes, I will put that Nyx Bloom Ancient onto the battlefield for free during my upkeep. I will do that. Thank you. And let me grant them haste while I'm at it and make you all sad. Yeah, so... All of these get better because they allow you to guarantee at least the first time hit that second part of the ability. Right. Uh, yeah, we also wrote down Kodama just because that's also cheating permanence in, so... Yeah, and you get two. You get a land and another land or a creature and another crazy thing. Kodama's good on his own. Doesn't need this this card that's going to be have yeah. a high variance, though. And Kodama I, has reach, too, which helps you right. for the monarch. Yeah. The most important part about the course for me is that they all add the wonderful ability to give good old monarch to the game. So yeah. If you're looking to add monarch... Maybe the courts are your answer. And I think a lot of games, like, my more fun decks do make choices like that, where they're like, ah, listen, you know, my last 15 cards are not the best 15 cards I could put in the deck. Yeah. But they are fun cards, and I'm looking to make a fun experience. And I do want to put some Monarch into my deck when I can, because Monarch is a fun uh, mechanic. Well, speaking of more Monarch, let's move on to White. So we're going to be talking about White and Red today, and then doing sort of a mini retrospective on Boros, just to see, you know, after now a couple of years of us sort of pushing the issue, how far we've come on that road. And that road, by the way, I'll say now, is probably going to, we're going to keep going down that road based on what we're That saying. road is a little rocky. <laughs> yeah, but at least, the, you know, they're, they're starting to pave it a little bit. Um, all right, the Archon of Coronation, four white, white for a five, five flyer creature Archon. When it enters the battlefield, you become the monarch. As long as you're the monarch, damage doesn't cause you to lose life. However, when a creature deals combat damage to you, its controller still becomes the monarch. You're just not losing life, but they can still deal combat damage, which is the only thing that monarch needs to switch hands. Right, this doesn't also, it's not a card that gives you the monarch and says you can't lose the monarch. Right. Yeah. Uh, this card is, it's interesting. Um, I don't think it's wonderful. It's a six mana, five, five flyer that gives you the monarch which is like okay cool but six mana five five flyer draw a card 
it's getting closer to fun and playable. Uh, the not lose life bit is interesting, though, because there are some cards that I think go well with that. Yeah, you can take advantage of the fact that you can't lose life. Like, Command the Dread Horde is kind of the big one. Uh, yeah. It's that four black, black sorcery. You choose any number of target creatures and or Planeswalker cards in graveyards, and then Command the Dread Horde deals damage to you equal to the converted mana cost of all that stuff you chose, and then you put it onto the battlefield. Well, our kind of Coronation says, well, you don't take any of that damage. That's cool. Yeah, just put everything out. Go nuts. <laughs> Have fun. All right, the next white card is Armored Sky Hunter. Three in a white for a 3-3 three, three flying cat knight. Whenever it attacks, you look at the top six cards of your library. You may put an aura or equipment card from among them onto the battlefield. If an equipment is put onto the battlefield this way, you may attach it to a creature you control. Put the rest of those cards on the bottom of your library in a random order. Okay. If it's an aura, you'll also get to attach it because auras have to attach when they come to the battlefield. Sort of like Quite. a Sigarda's Aid type thing here. Where yeah, you get, you get to the skip the, um, the equip cost. It's also on attack, so you can swing with it, attach something to uh, it. Oh, okay. You won't get attack triggers, like if it's Sword of the Animus or something, but you if it's Sword of Feast and Famine or whatever, you'll get right. you know, on combat damage type stuff. Um, top six is quite a few. Usually, a lot of times we see it's like top three or three, four, which yeah. I think for an equipment aura deck would be bad because in order to hit out of the top six, you really want to have around 20 mm -hmm. auras and equipment combined, which is high, but I think you can hit that in, some of the, in most of these decks. But if it was top four or three, then you'd really want like 25 or 30 of those things, which you usually don't have. Yeah, so your Akiri, your Wyleths, all of the Boros equipment decks are looking for this, basically. Um, maybe that's how they give white card advantage. It's like, when this enters the battlefield, look at the top 50 cards of your library. We don't care. White needs some help. Look through your entire Just deck. Just find one thing out of there. <laughs> you can run one of them in your deck, and at this point, then you're fine. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I think it's good for those equipment decks, and there are a number of them, because they keep on making them. They just made two in the last like few months. Yeah. Uh, and it's it's card advantage. It's not the same as card draw because you can't hit land drops by by doing this. And it's not that different than stuff that White's already doing, right? Mm -hmm. But it is a welcome addition to those narrow strategies. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Now, and it's a next knight. one. It's a knight as well. Yeah. The next one is is by far the standout, maybe of the entire freaking set. For White. Yeah, for White, certainly. And just for the fact that it exists, finally. It's Keeper of the Accord, three in the white for a three, four human soldier. At the beginning of each opponent's end step, that if that player controls more creatures than you, create a one, one white soldier creature token. At the beginning of each opponent's end step, if that player controls more lands than you, you may search your library for a basic planes card, put it onto the battlefield, tapped, then shuffle your library. So this could potentially trigger up to three times on the turn rotation yeah if you match me in a situation player. where every other player has more lands than you on each of their uh, on it's each of their turns right then you will get a land for each of them this will catch you up pretty quick but yeah. it eventually catches you up to whoever's in the lead which i really really like rather oh, than right. whoever is in the, the next the, the next yeah, yeah in third place or whatever assuming you're in fourth so every time we've seen this in play it has been very very good mm -hmm. it really is a an amazing tool for white to have and single-handedly will keep white decks in games that they wouldn't be in otherwise. We saw in game nights. I think that's really what happened. Rachel got three lands off of this thing mm -hmm. and it never felt like she had that Boros problem we see all the time where she just has two to three less mana than all the other players, which is a big gap. And she was making big plays near the end of the game that she wouldn't have been able to make if she didn't have Keeper of the Court. So I really do think this is a really good card going in most white decks. Yep. It's basically, four mana seems like the slot now for like, this is the auto-include. Rhystic Study aside, we, we look at Smothering Tithe, we look at this, you look at the experimental frenzies of the world. These are the ones that are like, all right, these could shift the tide of a game and put the advantage finally back into the colors that really need it. Because Keeper of the Cord, right, if you're playing it on turn four and you just have two players that are three lands ahead of you, you're going to be able to get some of that equity back. And you may be even going more, right? Like me playing the blue-black deck and seeing Keeper of the Cord out made me go, I want that. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be great. Even if you only get one land, it's pretty good, right? It's provided that you're going to get white, another, you're gonna get mana, another get land, land probably next time. And yeah, if yeah. you only get one land, what does that tell you? I have the same amount of lands of everybody. Right. So I'm actually in a pretty good spot, right? Good point. Good point. So... Yeah, this card, I just like it a lot. There's been some people grumbling a little about it, which I can't understand. This is the best white card in the set. Um, in the past year. By a mile. This is probably, smother it's yeah. in Smothering Tithe. I think this is the si single best white card we've seen. Yeah, this or is not as good as Smothering Tithe. It's a it's a step or two steps below, but it is, it is I agree, probably the best white card we've seen since Smothering Tithe, Yep. which is saying a lot. And then before then, it was like, what, Circle of Protection Red? <laughs> wow i mean that card Shade. hoses me man it just hoses me 
<laughs> All right. There's nothing else in between. Okay. The next card is an interesting one. Cool art by Seb McKinnon. It's Promise of Tomorrow. Two and a white for an enchantment. Whenever a creature you control dies, exile it. Well, that seems bad. Mm. At the beginning of each end step... If you control no creatures, sacrifice Promise of Tomorrow and return all cards exiled with it to the battlefield under your control. Ah, so now we've seen this a couple of times now. White is getting more in the world of card advantage through sort of flicker. Reusing stuff, getting it back, having it exit enter the battlefield. Uh, Livio is the commander that's doing this on that side from, from this set. And Promise of Tomorrow is another step in that direction. And three mana, you know, not too bad. I think also price. they might be leaning towards white, like rather than say, hey, white's going to get a bunch of extra gas from its deck, they're sort of saying, hey, what if we made white able to maintain its board a little bit better? Right. So Akroma's Will kind of does that. Yep. Uh, and this kind of helps you on a different axis even too, because indestructible is one way, but exile effects hurt you. This is um, when a creature you control dies, goes to exile. So it, I guess it's sort of more like, it doesn't save, right? If they path to exile your thing, then Promise of Tomorrow doesn't care because yeah. it, it doesn't, it doesn't, uh, it only Die. cares if a creature dies, yeah. I think you have to have a sack outlet if you're playing Promise of Tomorrow because the ideal situation is like, oh, I want to reset my board, I can sack everything and then this will trigger and they'll get them all back. Right, oh, yeah, because let's be honest, if you've got this out on the battlefield, they're not going to Wrath of God or Board Wave, right? Not if you're the problem. If you're, yeah, if you're the problem, then they know, shoot, if I do this, they're going to get all this step back they're going to try and get rid of the promise but you can mm -hmm. so that's another thing you can do is play this and then wrath now you're the only one with the board and it kind of turns your wraths into cyclonic rift right one time right but three mana into a four mana wrath so that's nice turn two cards in synergy into a cyclonic rift that uh well whatever you got to do what you got to do it's <laughs> Again, risky you, though right this is yes. risky because white does have a number of cards that care if things are in your graveyard or want thing or to recur things from your graveyard. brought backs of ends reclamation yeah so so exiling your thing when it dies it's not always good because you know let's say that they, it's like something dies something dies and or even board wipe and then they go destroy promise of tomorrow before the end step mm. yeah that sucks and your stuff is exiled yeah, so that's why Promise of Tomorrow, like you wrote, is a little bit better with the Vidal Canoris or the Ley Lines of Anticipations because someone board wipes and then before they move to their end step, you flash. No, you flash oh, you flash is in response to the board wipe. Right, so you and they don't see it coming. Back. Yeah. I think you're going to be in real trouble if you just play this out there and hope that like, what are, what are you expecting your opponents to do? They can see the promise of tomorrow. You're expecting them to like Supreme Verdict and just be like, oh no, what happened? All your stuff comes back. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, maybe the idea is that white is already so weak that the promise of tomorrow in a mono white deck isn't going to be the game breaker. But this is good in other potential decks. Um, if you run this with Sun Titan and a sack outlet, oh Sun Titan, again, gets a CMC three or less card from your permanent. That's a permanent from your graveyard to the battlefield. So you have Sun Titan and a bunch of stuff out. You sack it all to a sack outlet. They all get exiled with promise. And at the end of turn, you sack Sack promise, Sun Titan comes back, gets the promise back. And so you can get the full board entering the battlefield every, every single turn. turn. Yeah. Yep. So that's definitely the combo I think you would be most interested in there. Um, and then I think this will have use in other color decks. A white-blue flicker deck with Brago or something, you know, like it's already an effect that you're looking for. And this kind of protects Brago at the same time. Mm. All right. The next one is... Also Seb McKinnon art. So, you know, yeah, in the art instant, is sweet. instant win. All right. The next one is Seraphic Greatsword. It's one in a white for an artifact equipment... Equip equipped creature gets plus two plus two whenever equipped creature attacks the player with the most life or tied for the most life create a f four four white angel creature token with flying that's tapped and attacking that player that's like guys of saint trap basically mm -hmm. but the equip cost on this thing is four so two to play one in white and four to equip does give plus two plus two and then on attack you make the four four flyer that's tapped and attacking. It's not exactly Geist of Saint Trafta also because the angel sticks around. That's nice. Yeah. The equip cost of four sucks. <laughs> that's that a lot. Yeah, so you're gonna want to play your Cigar to Zaid, Pure Steel Paladin, the ways to cheat the mana cost, like that bird that we saw earlier as well. Um Armored Sky Hunter. Cheat that equip cost, yeah. Um however Armored Sky Hunter doesn't combo with this because it, it the they're already attacking. But this is something that over time, if that creature is a Wyleth or whatever and they don't get removed, will make you a lot of value. Four or four white angel creature tokens in the air have been known to end the game on occasion. Yeah, that's definitely true. Although this is slow, right? Like how yeah. often is three attacks in a row? You get, yeah, you get three angels, but that's just like not a lot of games. I don't like this card much. I just think the equip cost is too high. Yeah. Um, and no one plays Moon Silver Spear, which kind of does the same thing, but costs a little bit more. And that can go into any deck. Yeah. So, it's a tough world uh, for for equipment. It's always it's always been. Yeah. 
they already have the downside that if you don't have a creature, this card doesn't do anything. So you need some setup. Yeah. And then the fact that it's like six mana to get this going and like... Just hope that the creature that's equipped you doesn't get removed because that's another four mana. That uh, could be half your turn pretty much. Yeah, or your whole turn. Yeah. And how happy are you if you're like, play, equip, swing, make a 4-4? Four, four? Not. You have to make the second 4-4 four, four before you're even decently happy because six mana for a 4-4 four, four flyer is not that great. Yeah. And the second one, they see it. They know what's coming. So they're going to board wipe. They're going to whatever because they don't want you making 12 of these things. Well, even if they don't board wipe, everyone's going to go like, well, that's a problem. We all see that if he kills me or she kills me or they kill me with those 4-4s, four then they're going to turn them on you next. So everyone goes, okay, let's just get it off the creature. Let's kill the creature. Let's kill the player, whatever it is. Yeah, I think it's maybe with extra combat steps, it could be good. Totally. There's that Breath of Fury card that you like enchant a different creature you control and sacrifice it to get like extra combat steps. Right. I think there's probably some way to use that with this, but... Wait, the problem with this though is that the extra combat steps the angels don't have haste they can't attack again oh that's a really unless good the card says they gain haste until end of turn well you usually just with breath of fur, you just sack the last one you made I attack see. again and yeah. then make the other one sack the last one you made I, I guess i don't know i don't know if that actually works but it feels like it might it feels bad that this is a mythic and yeah. also in this slot is jeweled lotus i can okay. see how it's really good <laughs> in draft and 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 the, right. the this is a bomb in draft yeah just the true. rarities are more important for draft than they are for us. I mean, obviously, it affects the price of the card, but it affects how often you see it. But yeah. in draft, like, yeah. If that was a rare and running around all the time, people would just lose to that card constantly, I think. Yeah. Okay, the next but, is... But yeah. would it be that much better in draft if it was three to equip? Uh, no, I think it'd be, it'd be about, about the, the same, about right? the same, yeah. And then I think it would be way better for us. Yeah. For a commander. Jeez, even make it two to equip, to be honest. <laughs> that seems... Yeah. Then it's really good, though. Yeah, but at that point, how many people are still running equipments, right? It's true. Like, it's making true. the equipment deck slightly better because like, they have Like, do you suddenly put it in all your decks if it's two to equip? No. No. <laughs> no. So, <laughs> maybe, yeah. Okay. All right. Next up is Slash the Ranks. We did talk about this in our preview episode, so we're just going to direct you to that, but we'll read the card anyway. Three white, white for a sorcery. Destroy all creatures and planeswalkers except for commanders. And commander is usually being the thing you most want to kill because their whole strategy is revolving around their commander. So yeah. the fact, that, uh, if you're a Voltron deck, that's the only thing that we kind of think that probably goes in. I still don't think it's very good, and that just runs tragic arrogance. It does kill Planeswalker decks yeah. on the spot. So if you're playing against a bunch of those, then be on the lookout. Yeah, ultimately, I don't think it's that good. Okay, the yeah. last one is Soul of Eternity. Five white white for a star star creature avatar. It says its power and toughness are equal to your life total. Ooh, this could be a 40-40. So this is Sarah avatar, but it costs one less white. Right. So it's five white white. So it's the same total cost, but it doesn't need three white. But this card has encore for seven white white. So if you if it's in your graveyard, you pay seven white white, exile this card from your graveyard. For each of your opponents, you create a token that's a copy and attacks that opponent this turn if able. They gain haste. You sacrifice them at the beginning of the next end step. So if this is in your graveyard and you're at 30 life, you'll create three 30 30s and they'll all attack one of your opponents. That costs nine mana to do that. Um... I don't know, Jimmy. What do you think about Yowza. this thing? Uh, I mean, like, I'm not super stoked on it. This is the kind of card that you do play in a Burning Anger on mm. uh, or a Monstrous Onslaught because it's got a massive power. But those are sort of combos that we've known with. Other uh, massive power others, things. Yeah, Sarah's Avatar type stuff in the past. Oh, this is interesting. Uh, yeah, Tristani Selesnia's voice allows you to uh, gain life equal to the power of creature toughness. And so that makes the Sarah Soul Eternity bigger and bigger. And then you can play one green and white and tap the Sol Tristani to populate. Oh, so let's say you encore it and you're at 20. Yeah. Three of them would enter. So three triggers on a stack. You gain 20. So now you're at 40. You gain 40. You're now at 80. You gain 80. You're now at 160. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's pretty good. And then you populate it and make and it make, even bigger. And then now you're yeah. at 320. Yeah. And then in that case, maybe you are playing Ailey with this card because you can sacrifice a creature to gain life equal to the creature's toughness. Or also good with the encore just to use them before they die. Yeah. Or you want to play Evra, Halcyon Witness, and you pay four and then you switch your life total with the power and then you're good, you know, you're just making a massive Evra or something. I, you know, there's a lot of different things. Again, this is the same idea, Brian. Ryan Stout Arm, just chuck them. Fling it at people. Fling it. Chandra's Ignition. Yep. Uh, Terror of the Peaks. Again, another creature enters the battlefield under control. It deals damage equal to that creature's power to any target. So that could just be with Encore. So just your life total to, to somebody's face. Bam. Just wreck someone, right? But it's seven mana to cast this thing or nine. Nine mana to, to encore, encore, yeah. 
again, this I'll is... I'll it with Terror of the Peaks. <laughs> <It seems laughs> That's sweet, hilarious, yeah. yeah. You might just kill everyone. Yeah. Depending 30, on your 30, life 30, 30 dead. But yeah. they can see all those pieces coming, right? Like, yeah. there's a lot of mana to do. You're unlikely to do it in one turn. Maybe I mean, with Mana Geyser. Yeah, Mana Geyser. But also, like, now that we have more casual fun options, I can just see people running cards like this. Because Zara's Avatar is just fun for the... the I'd say the more Timmy players to be like, my creature's power is massive! Right. Look at the things I can do with it! So at least it's got some fun potential, I think, there, even if it is a little bit overcosted. <laughs> yeah, it's funny that they looked at Sarah Avatar and they were like, we can just make a straight up better version than that. Like, there's little niche cases like Devotion to White or whatever, but in general, this is Soul of Eternity is just better than Sarah's Avatar like 99% of the time, right? Anytime you have a second line of text that you can use as an option, even if you never do it, just almost always makes the card better. Yeah, and the casting cost is easier. Yeah. All right, uh, so we'll talk about how we think white did at the end. Let's move on to red here. Okie dokie. All right, the first red card is Coercive Recruiter. Four in a red for a 4-3 Orc Pirate. When Whenever coerc- Coercive Recruiter or another pirate enters the battlefield under your control, gain control of target creature until end of turn. Untap that creature. Until end of turn, it gains haste and becomes a pirate in addition to its other types. Wow. Pirates are really getting all the toys in this set. A lot of cool pirate stuff. I actually think Commander of Legends is nice because it has helped bolster a lot of sort of smaller, more niche strategies. And pirates is, I think, a really well-loved tribe in Magic. So, This is also just like another um, Zealous Conscripts. Right. Because it says uh, any target creature. It doesn't have to be your opponent. So yeah, why play... did they say opponent? Because you want to have another combo piece with Kiki Jiki that goes infinite. Splinter you, Twin, too. Yeah, Splinter Twin. You copy the course of Recruiter, it untaps itself, and just keep targeting and untapping itself with Kiki Jiki or whatever. Boom. Lots Congratulations, we broke Kiki Jiki and Splinter Twin. Good job, us. Yay. Uh, again, if you're playing the Pirate deck, you're all about stealing stuff anyway. Um, if you want sack outlets in those decks, that's a, a great way to abuse this ability. The fact that anytime you play a Pirate, you threaten affect something is pretty powerful, cool. especially if you have an altar or something out all of a sudden. Mm-hmm. Anytime and you play a Pirate, you kill a creature. Also, probably hit somebody with the first. Yeah. Yeah. I so like Admiral that. Beckett Brass or the new Zara, those are both good options, I think, for these cards. There's a bunch of partners. You can honestly to. probably make a hundred card pirate deck just from the cards in this set. Okay. Next up is Ember Wild Captain Three in a red for a four two gin pirate. When it enters the battlefield, you become the monarch. This also might kind of be a cycle as well because we had the Archon of Coronation. Yeah. Uh, I like the four mana one better than the six mana one. <laughs> yeah, four mana already better. Whenever an opponent attacks you while you're the monarch, Ember Wild Captain deals damage to that player equal to the number of cards in their hand. Oh, so, and it also interacts with whether you're the monarch or not. Yeah, and this could be a lot of damage. Again, like we said, six damage from the Black Court was a lot. You know, this could be anywhere between four and six when people attack you this is sort of like sort of war and peace which has that same ability when it when it deals damage you'll deal damage equal to the number of cards in their hand mm-hmm. um but this seems like a much better way to stop someone from trying to attack you especially if it's a crap i gotta swing with you with a bunch of stuff and take damage and you might be able to chump block some of my stuff or kill it you might be in blue you might have nine cards 10 cards 15 cards in your hand it might say you cannot attack me you will die at that case you don't need the monarch if you have 15 cards in your hand too but a lot of times you draw a bunch of cards and then you're waiting to get back to your turn and you're a little bit vulnerable on that one moment right but also just like i have mana open and if you're in blue like what if i just stroke of genius or something mm-hmm. just so that you'll take 12 that is a little bit scary i think it's just more effective at deterring um you from getting attacked yeah it seems seems pretty decent yeah, you put Strionic Resonator on here just to double it up if someone oh, does decide God. to attack you. You could literally kill somebody where they think they're okay. Yeah. With the form engine. It has the same, yeah, same idea yeah. there. Um, oh, Nin the Pain one. Artist. This is interesting. Uh, it's a blue-red 1-1 one, one wizard. You can pay X blue and a red and tap Nin, and then Nin deals X damage to target creature. That creature's controller draws X cards. So in the Nin deck, if you have another creature, or even, I guess, with the Ember Wild trigger on the stack you could do it right Mm -hmm. um they'll just be really hard to attack you if you just have your mana open yeah you make them draw 10 cards and then now they attack you with the trigger on the stack and boom they deal you know (laughs) so much damage to them um thantis the war weaver and we'll talk about these a couple of times pramicon marisi uh these are all cards that control combat or make people need to attack so cards like emerald wild captain get a little bit better in those scenarios as well they kind of tell people where they have to attack too so making it so that only one player can attack you with pramicon or whatever 
you can choose the player that's likely to have the most cards and then they're even mm-hmm. less likely to attack you yeah that's another deck archetype that's starting to yeah. grow up which is like we have menace tribal and death touch tribal now we kind of have like everyone needs to attack tribal so it's kind of cool seeing or my these. deck tells you like this yeah. is how you have to attack and you have you have to attack every turn but you can only attack to the left or whatever yeah that kind of design space i'm interested in much more than the let's just make smothering tithes <laughs> Much more than the another landfall. Trigger. Yeah, more yeah. landfalls. Oh, green got the best stuff again. It's more like cool. Let's play with the mechanic that's not as often loved and see where we can take it. Okay, next one. Yes. All right. It is Fathom Fleet Sword Jack. This is a deck I probably should have had in my game night stack. It's three and a red for a four three orc pirate. Whenever it attacks, it deals damage to the player or planeswalker it's attacking equal to the number of artifacts you control. Oh, because you played Togo. Yeah. And how many rocks did you have at one point? I mean, and treasures. I mean, I had like close to 20 artifacts. So. That's like a Josh Lee Quai special <laughs> is like there should be a little artifact counter <laughs> bing, for bing, how many bing. you have. I yeah. made a lot. And maybe you'll hit like a world record or something someday <laughs> <laughs> without going infinite. That's right, right. Without yeah. actually checking if it's a world record too. <laughs> <laughs> That's um, how it works. It also has Encore for five and a red. So if you have a lot of artifacts and this is in your graveyard, this could be a lot of damage out of nowhere. Yeah, it could just be a kill, right? If you're mm-hmm. playing Togo, you have 10 artifacts, or if you play Smothering Tithe, have a bunch. Oh play a wheel, you're in the wheel colors, and so you're wheeling, making a bunch of, of artifacts, Fathom Fleet attacks, for, for Smothering Tithe, or yeah. you encore it. Uh, your Hellkite Tyrant type decks. <laughs> Although if you've hit somebody with Hellkite Tyrant, you're probably just going to win that game. Yeah. It, it, you know, 20 more artifacts, that's a lot. Yeah. But at the very least, you can gain control a bunch of artifacts and then Fathom Fleet, which is to punish them for what you stole from them. Um, the encore is nice. I mean, because it's like, yeah, you play it, you mm-hmm. swing around with it maybe it dies and then you just wait for an opportunity and if you ever find it where you've got a lot of artifacts out and just boom yeah hit everybody for a lot i like this in my neheb deck because neheb is five man this is six to encore it so you could play neheb and you're probably ramping that with rocks and then you encore the uh, fathom fleet sword jack and then that is able to give you a lot of to combat damage to players um as a result or just damage to or players damage yeah, yeah yeah and and so that again gives you a ton of yeah, damage even if you neheb. only have four artifacts that's 12 mana through neheb so yeah and neheb again you're in mono red you are playing every single card discard rock. loot everything you can and rock to get to you know playing your cards early um, and then finally, I think like there are a lot of mono red artifact commanders that this just fits nicely in. Bosch, Gadrick the Crown, the Crown Scourge, Doretti Scrap Savant, yep. you name it. So good job, Fathom Fleet. Good job. Good job. All right. Next up, we have the Flamekin Herald, two and a red for a three-two elemental wizard. Commander spells you cast have Cascade. Oh, this is nice. I guess. Yeah. I mean, I think this works. This is a card that you could argue goes. And it's a like vanilla slot in any deck with a commander. <laughs> I mean, sure, just because you, you get will a, get you'll value get off something of it. off it, right? I don't like it as much as that at three mana because three mana is a really crowded slot and tends yeah. to be the most crowded slot in in my commander decks two and three anyway. Yeah, um, and we found out when we did our mini stats episode again earlier this year that you don't actually cast your commander that many times in a game Mm -hmm. two Uh, at most right around there it was less than two yeah yeah um with partners maybe this gets a little better because you have two commanders that you can cast and so you know maybe you do it more often there's also like recently and specifically in this set they started kind of doing cascade tribal so averna is the new one that kind of cares about Cascade. It's the one that as you Cascade, you may put a land card from among the exiled cards onto the battlefield. So you just want to Cascade more in that deck. So this is another way to Cascade. So it definitely goes in the Averna deck. But do you just play this like... Mails from Wanderer, Cascade, Cascade, right? Do you play this in the Mails from Wanderer deck? Does it matter that much if you Cascade a third time? Do you want? Is this card worth that? Probably not. I think the best way to use this if you're looking competitive is, okay, my commander is a two CMC commander. I only have this card at one CMC in my deck. So when I cast my commander, I guaranteed get this out. It's a combo piece or whatever it is. Yep. And that's sort of like the ad nauseum type decks where you're just specifically trying to get one thing You're turning out. this into a tutor, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's, again, like you have to build your whole deck around that. And as we've seen, not too many companion companion decks so i don't think too many people are doing that especially on the more casual side of edh and i'd say most decks it actually probably makes it weaker to only run one one drop in your deck or whatever yeah totally then it makes it stronger so I mean, it's soul ring and then you know yeah. there's a lot of other good things there yeah, yeah. um i think omnath locus of the royal is the elemental one of the omnath so this could care about flamekin herald so that's just something to keep in mind if we're going that direction but yeah. otherwise not that exciting yeah i don't think so either all right is it my turn or your yeah, turn? Yeah, I think it's your turn. Okay. Well. Wait, it's this guy. Oh, dang it. Because <laughs> the next one's really awesome. You can take this one too. You get two in a row because this is the one I want to talk about. Okay. So. 
Uh, the next one is Frenzy to Saddle. <laughs> We're like jockey for who gets to talk about You know we both get to talk about all of them. Oh, all yeah, them, right? that's right. <laughs> who gets to read the card and sound excited while they do it? <laughs> all right, Frenzy to Saddle Brute. Feeling bad because it no one was fighting over it. No. <laughs> it's but four, it's a cool card, too. It is, it is. Actually, I think this card's quite good. Um, it's four and a red for a 5-4 orc warrior. Has haste, but it says all creatures can attack your opponents and planeswalkers your opponents control as though they those creatures had haste. Oh, So I, this gives haste to everything against your opponents, not against cool. you. That's cool. It doesn't actually give haste. They can attack, attack as your opponents though. as though they had haste. So they cannot activate activated abilities with haste speed. They can only attack. But still... Actually, this I think that's cool. better, right? So they can't play like a Tim and use it against yeah, you. Yeah, 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 yeah. The nice thing here is that, one, it's a Mardu Horde throwback. I love Carnes of Tarkir mm -hmm. uh, for the Horde. Uh, and also, just like, it's a great way to keep the Monarch if you're playing a Monarch type deck because everyone yeah. else is going to be like, I'm going to swing at you with the, oh, I can play all this stuff. Concordant Crossroads is already one of the most powerful cards. Um, it is, of course, one mana and enchantment. But this is Red's version of that. So I'm actually kind of up on this. Yeah, I just like this design quite a bit because it's a way to make haste and the fact that red has haste into an advantage for them mm -hmm. on defense you yeah. know not just on offense because any creature that gets played right away also the fact that they're gonna be nailing each other is really good for you and they're gonna be tapping out so that you know they don't necessarily have as many blockers up for so for you to do your things with your haste because yeah. this still gives you haste against all your opponents yeah the nice thing is that a lot of people sometimes in in the scenarios where it's like we got to get rid of this person it's like i can't i don't have haste i can play these creatures but they can't do anything so frenzy style brute definitely increases again the pace of the game which is something that red continues and continues to do and now this more control the combat step stuff so fumiku the fumiko the low blood is the mono red version of this but like we said thantis kahiji Pramicon, Tangarth first mate. These are all cards that are incentivizing you to attack. Yes, yeah, that control the combat step. Or uh, incentivize deck, it. Deck that we're talking about. And I think this goes in those decks because you're like, okay, everybody can only attack to their left. You, oh, you all have to attack. Oh, and now you have haste yeah. if you attack, not me. Okay. You know, that's all, that adds up into some cool uh, situations that I think, like you said, it's it's interesting design space. At the very least, I'm glad to see games go faster, and these types of cards definitely contribute towards that, and their powerful effects on their own. All right, let's talk about this card, which I believe is pretty crazy. It's Hellkite Courser. Four red red for a 6-5 dragon with flying. It says, when Hellkite Courser enters the battlefield, you may put a commander you own from the command zone onto the battlefield. Whoa. It gains haste. Return it to the command zone at the beginning of the next end step. So this card kind of sneak attacks your commander out. That's pretty good. It is quite good. One thing I want... Well, let's talk about the cards it's good with. Everyone's talking... The first one that comes to mind that seems insane with it is... Ur-Dragon! Because Hellcat Courser also costs one less, so now it's a five Dragon. mana spell. And then the Ur-Dragon comes out whenever one of It's a 10-10 that's typically nine mana, mm -hmm. um, but it's a flyer that's a 10-10. And whenever one or more dragons you control attack, draw that many cards and you may put a permanent card from your hand onto the battlefield. So, so Ur Dragon says, I can attack because I have haste from the Hellkite Courser, and I will put a permanent on the battlefield. Battle. It's probably another dragon that's big and scary. Yep, seems really good. Uh, also, really good with Obeka, right? Because Obeka, ah, yes. Obeka comes out, she has haste, and you're supposed to put her in the command zone at the beginning of the next end step, but you can actually tap her to end the turn. And mm -hmm. so, this just gets Obeka onto the battlefield for free. Yeah, you can put the Progenitus out. <laughs> oh boy. The, right? And like, now we're just talking about the crazy things. If you play this with a Zara Renegade Recruiter, then you're stealing something from someone's hand as well. Yep. These are all commanders that care about attacking. Aurelia, the War Leader, is going to give you extra Multiple combat attacks. steps. The new Sakashima, I really like this edition here that you put out because it brings back your other partner. Right. So, you go Hellkite Courser. I'm going to choose Sakashima. It's going to come in as a Hellkite Courser. And with that trigger, I'm going to take out my other partner. And now you've got two things out onto the battlefield. Again, it's going to go back to your command zone at the beginning of the next end step. But still, you know, you can get a lot done by just having your commanders on the battlefield, right? Yeah. And you can also flicker them to keep them around permanently, too. Yeah. So if you're in blue, you can Dead Eye Navigator real quick, flicker it, and it yeah. considers it a new permanent. Now there's combo -y stuff you can do with. Oh, no, wait. We're not done talking about cool cards. Yeah. <laughs> Ilharg, Atali. These are both cards that just want the haste, want to get one attack in, are going to get a lot of value off that attack. Okay, now let's talk about combo-y things. Okay. Bladewing the Risen. Yep, so it's three black, black, red, red for a 4-4 four, four legendary zombie dragon. When it enters the battlefield, you're going to return target dragon permanent card from your graver to the battlefield. Wait a minute. Yeah, return so... Return target dragon permanent. So if you have a sack outlet, you can just sack the Hellkite Courser in response to that trigger. Right. Then sack the Bladewing in response to its trigger. Then bring the Hellcart Courser back with the Bladewing trigger. Bring the Bladewing back in with the Hellcart 
Corsair. Type trigger and just keep doing that. Yep. And then if you're doing to a Phyrexian altar or something like that, then you can create the mana you need to pump everything eventually into Bladewing mm-hmm. to swing either with Bladewing eventually when you don't sack it and just use the haste or with the rest of your dragons. Or just a goblin bombardment. Kill yep. them all. <laughs> Gerard Weatherlight uh, Hero is the similar thing, right? Because Gerard Weatherlight Hero is a uh, creature that says when it dies, you exile it and return to the battlefield. All artifact and creature cards in your graveyard that were put there from the battlefield this turn. Ah. So again, sack Hellkite Courser, sack Gerard. Gerard goes to the command zone. Hellkite Courser comes out, bring Gerard's back out. Sack, right. sack, sack, bring it back in. Again, infinite enters the battlefield, infinite leaves, triggers, all that Arthros, stuff. impact tremors, all kinds of things can take advantage of that. Uh, Goblin Bombardment, if that's mm-hmm. your sack outlet with... Gerard Rather Light Hero just wins off the damage from Garvin Bombardment. Kiki Jiki, for the 80th time this episode, you do the same thing. You copy the Hellkite Courser and you sack the Kiki Jiki. When the Hellkite Courser comes in, Kiki sees it in the graveyard, comes back out, and boom, make another Hellkite Courser over and over and over again. Yep. Um, yeah. So oh, I wanted to make a note here. Doing this does not increase the commander tax on your commander either. A lot of people Ah. I saw online were saying that. But commander tax, if you'll recall, the rule is that it counts the number of times you've cast your commander from the command zone each game. You've Hellkite Course is not casting it. It's just bringing it into play from the command zone. So you can do all those shenanigans, and even if they get stopped somehow, uh, your commander's just going to cost what it would have cost otherwise. So pretty interesting. Okay, cool. Good job, Hellkite Courser. You're (laughs) combo-tastic. All right, this next card, well, we won't spend too much time on, but I really like it because it's got a lot of value. It's Impulsive Pilfer. It's the Don't Sleep on Me comment of the set. It's also, a, it's a goblin. It's a goblin, too. It's a 1-1 one, one goblin pirate. When it dies, you create a treasure token. So it's a 1-1 one, one mana, one red mana, 1-1. One, one. When it dies, make a treasure. But it's got Encore for 3 and a red. So it, I think this is actually really good in your Corvold, Perforos, Goblin Tribal decks. If you have a sack outlet, you only need to tap 4 mana total to Encore it out because you play it for 1, and then you sack it to the whatever it is to get a treasure. You use that and three more lands to encore and boom you get three three of these and then you can sack those three to get another three treasures so for four mana you get four creatures entering and leaving the battlefield four total artifacts entering and potentially leaving the battlefield and you can just pair that with any sacrifice outlets or cards that care about having artifacts on yada yada Corvold. Oh, it's so good in Corvold. And so, the treasures he's yeah, got you just too. get so many different things off of one a one mana card. So I think this is really good just as a like common like and and very rarely do you see a common provide that much value especially when you have so many cards you can combo with it mm-hmm, mm-hmm. i like it it's a it's ramp too right like yeah it's, you can i guess you're gonna have to get it killed somehow but i just sack it there's yeah. lots of sack outlets now these days so yeah that's a good point i like okay. it all right the next one is port razor three red red for an orc pirate it's a four four when it deals combat damage to a player Untap each creature you control. After this combat phase, there is an additional combat phase. But it says Port Razor can't attack a player it has already attacked this turn. Mm. So it doesn't go infinite because it can't just like hit Jimmy, then hit Jimmy again. If it hits Jimmy the second time, well, it can't actually attack Jimmy the second time. So it has to be like hit Jimmy, hit Mel, hit Megan. Uh, That's all. I can't attack anymore, everybody. Yay. So uh, guess what card goes infinite with this? Kiki Jiki, because you make a new copy and then that copy can attack the same player just attacked for infinite combat steps. It only works if they can't block a 4-4. Right. Yeah, but yes. And then Brago as well, because you're flickering and they see see each other's new instances. Now, a big thing that people are talking about is you need to be able to, if you give this creature double strike, uh, because it cares about just if it's attacked that player this turn. So let's say I attack Josh. It's because when the untapping occurs. This is yes. another weird thing, kind of moragish about it. Read it yeah. again. Yeah. So whenever it deals combat damage to a player, untap each creature you control. After this combat phase, there is an additional combat phase. So there's so the a untap- period between those un- two sentences. Yeah. The untap happens at the damage being dealt. Right. Which is a weird point in time mm-hmm. for it to happen. So, so let's say I give this creature double strike and I attack Josh with it. It's going to deal combat damage twice, which gives me two extra combat phases. However, it only untaps at that moment. So it only so, un- untaps once. So if I go and attack Mel with this next, it's going to give me an extra combat phase, but it's not going to untap for the second combat phase that I get. Yep. So if you, anything, you have to give this vigilance. And double strike. <laughs> and double strike. So a fire shrieker and then like an angel's trumpet. And so that way you can attack someone, get two combat steps, and then you're able to attack with all your creatures on both those combat steps because your creatures aren't tapping. I think it's probably just easier to just give it Helm of the Host and go infinite, <laughs> yeah, kind of like nice. how Godot does, right? Like yeah. just keep making more of them so that you're hitting with multiple ones, and then the new one can always attack the player that you've already attacked. Deadeye Navigator or something Very like much. that to flicker it yeah. so that you can then attack players that you've already attacked. Yeah. Any These cards are always 
you know, powerful, but tough to get in, right? Like how many times have you actually connected with someone with a combat celebrant or whatever? Like, yeah, it's it, a five mana four, four, two. So you're not playing it early. Yeah, it happens, but it's just people have ways to deal with this type of thing. So they're not often caught off guard by it. Also, if they see this card on the battlefield, yeah. this is like a must remove type card, especially yeah. in decks are going to abuse the extra combats. The last red card, and it's a confusing one, but I actually think it's good, which is kind of unfortunate yes. because we're going to have to have discussions about how it works every time somebody plays it, but they should be playing it because it's good. Mm -hmm. Here we go. Wheel of Misfortune. Two in red for a sorcery. Each player secretly chooses a number zero or greater. Then all players reveal those numbers simultaneously and determine the highest and the lowest numbers revealed this way. Wheel of Misfortune deals damage equal to the highest number to each player who chose that number. Mm. Each player who didn't choose the lowest number discards their hand, then draws seven cards. Okay, so this is like a conditional, you don't necessarily have to wheel if this comes out. Because you could choose zero. Right. If you if somebody casts this and it's and you don't want to wheel, you can just choose zero mm -hmm. and there's no chance that you will wheel your hand away. Because it's each player who didn't choose the lowest number. So if everyone at the table said zero, no one wheels because that's right. the lowest number and the highest number, actually. Wait yeah. a minute. It's which is fine, because all you're noting is who chose the highest and who chose the lowest. Right. The ones in the middle don't matter at all. So if you're tied, you will note like Jimmy and Mel both chose three. Right. And Josh told chose zero so what will happen there is josh will not wheel because he has the lowest number jimmy and mel will wheel mm -hmm. but they'll also each take three because they both chose the highest number mm -hmm. now let's say jimmy chose four mel chose three and josh chose zero in this case josh will still take zero damage and he won't wheel jimmy will take four damage but both jimmy and mel will wheel. will wheel because they are not the lowest number right so you're trying to guess a number that will allow you to wheel if that's what you want to do that isn't the highest number so you don't take the damage right or if you don't care about the damage you can just choose like a number i, I here's why this is good it reads like one of those weird chaos cards that you're never going to play but it actually is a wheel of fortune in a lot of instances because if you just choose four you're going to wheel almost every time. Yeah, and if you take four damage, it's not the worst either. Yeah, so it's like Wheel of Fortune plus you take four. Are you still going to play that card? Because I play, I don't own that many Wheel of Fortunes. I own a few, and they go in almost every red deck because of their card draw. If you have three cards in your hand and you're going to draw up to seven, you just drew four cards for three mana. Yeah, uh, and here's the thing. I think almost always I there's going to be someone that's going to be like, I don't want to wheel right now. My hand's great. Take zero. And they'll take zero. So then you're pretty safe ca saying three or four. Um, Even if you say three or four, not everyone's going to say three or four, right? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, that's why I think four is the, the place where like a lot of people might say three, but not everybody's going to say, like maybe another player says four, but not everybody's going to do that, right? Yeah, I think Wheel of Misfortune is actually a fantastic card. It's a conditional wheel that will sometimes punish you if you say a too high of a number, but it's not like a massive crazy punishment. There's not that much chaos involved. It, and it's also something that in a political table, you can just go and say, hey, what's everyone choosing yeah what's everyone want to do i mean Although, they, they all say secretly or like you can say what's everyone want to do You're like well i don't want to wheel it's like oh cool cool if that person's probably going to say zero right. then i don't need to go crazy and say like 15 or something they can try and mess with you and and go one or two though yeah, but then they're yeah. they're playing with fire they might end up wheeling so yep uh what i like about this too is that it doesn't go in a lot of the wheel decks that want to force your opponents to wheel. Mm -hmm. So let's say somebody has a Narset out or Hole Breacher, which says, you know, basically right. what Leovold said, if you wheel, you end up with zero cards because you're not allowed to draw the extra cards. This allows you to be like, oh, then I'm going to choose zero so that I don't end up with zero cards. Yeah, I think you only get to draw one, right? Yeah, depending on whose turn it is and stuff yeah, like yeah, that yeah. Um, and which, which of those cards it is. But what ends up happening is that with a regular wheel, you don't get the choice, and then they just basically mass discarded everybody. But with Wheel of Misfortune, you can now dodge the wheel part. Even if you're like, I'd like two extra cards or three extra cards or whatever, but I'd, yeah. I'd rather not have zero cards. So I mean, the I, real feel bad is when you have to discard your hand and you don't want to. So yeah. I think Wheel of Misfortune is a really interesting and cool design, and I'm really glad it exists because Wheel of Fortune is not a cheap card. Anymore. Yeah, because it's on the reserve list. It's very expensive. But this is a card. Don't over, don't underestimate it. This is a card. We talked about it in the episode with Jesper, mm -hmm. where like if your deck has a low CMC, it's going to deploy its cards very quickly. You'll often end up in a situation where you have this card in hand and two other cards. You want to just cast it to just draw back up to seven. You're not trying to do the wheel shenanigans that like hurt the other players and stuff. Yeah. 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 So, and this, 
again, Zyrus and things like that, this is maybe not as good, which I like because those decks already have plenty of tools. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, look at it like that. This can almost always be like a wheel for myself if I want it. Yeah, totally. For plus three or four life, which is, I mean, that's it. I'll pay that price every time. Yeah. Unless I'm at three or four. <laughs> right. um, a couple cards you listed though are interesting oh per I forgot about the combo right, right. there's some combo -y things if you have like Pariah which is all damage that will be dealt to you is dealt to enchant a creature instead okay yeah yeah wait I want to walk through this okay okay so there is some combo potential because there are these redirect damage spe yes. spells in magic that say like if you would take damage redirect it to one of your creatures in those cases it says choose a number zero or greater I can choose 12 million as my number. Correct. Right. So now if I have Pariah, Pariah Shield, those both say if you would take damage, deal to this creature. Even better, something like Martyrdom, which is an instant mm -hmm. that basically allows you to do the same thing so people can't see it coming. Choose 12 million, redirect the damage to a creature. Now, if that creature is a stop hitting yourself creature like Boros Reckoner, Ooh. Brash Taunter, Ooh, stuffy, stuffy Doll, doll. one of these creatures that says when it takes damage, redirect that damage to an opponent, Spite Mare, you can deal 12 million damage to somebody's face through the wheel of misfortune that's when it actually is the wheel of misfortune yeah <laughs> <laughs> also there are a couple of cards that give like your it's it's a sorceries uh life oh, link life link yeah the like so far grand grand master. Master. Oh, so you could my go gosh. like you know 12 million and then you know alhammer's archive mm -hmm. if you would gain life gain double that life although yeah it's instead it's a replacement yeah, life yeah, link yeah happens yeah. at the time of damage so you'd actually come out with double that's pretty 24 intense 24 million life or whatever 12 nice. million life yeah and then you win right on the spot i mean craig just still infects you out so <laughs> don't rely on too much life total but still there's in there are some interesting things you could do in the right deck i just like to note anytime there's a stop hitting yourself piece that comes out yeah and finally that deck is coming together you yeah. called it like four years ago <laughs> All right, so we're going to do a quick little aside here about how Boros is doing. This might necessitate a whole episode where we sort of look back at what has happened. And keep in mind, this is something people forget, cards take two, three years from design to get to print. Gavin's been working on Commander Legends for, what, six years now? So that might be why people are frustrated, like, oh, we didn't see enough help for white or red in this yet. And it's like, well, look, it may be still upcoming in this next year because the time that we all started voicing that was about two, three years ago. So I think with Keeper of the Accordance, stuff we're starting to get there so white in terms of ramp keeper of the accord is a big improvement over cartographer's hawk i hope we see a couple more cards like this in the future but i don't think we need to push it too hard card advantage wise card we, draw specifically card draw there's nothing uh card advantage we got promise of tomorrow livio things that can kind of flicker and stuff but still not that much in card draw which is just sad um and flicker effects is how they get their card advantage and then there's some graveyard stuff like we have had sun titan in the past savage reclamation brought back and now we have triumphant reckoning but that's a nine mana spell so i don't, I don't think much. there's anything that really cracks the like top three or four well, as there's far no as recursion and things too right there's no like you gotta play this there's no you know mystic studies type things keeper of the court is the closest and i think it's yeah. a pretty good one but yeah it's the only standout for me of anything we talked about today everything else is like fine but yeah. Not amazing. And it's a little bit disappointing. I mean, I, I get what you're saying about Gavin working on the set for so long and they're working so far ahead. But also, I think there is a disconnect at Wizards between what constitutes like powerful white cards. Because there's been tweets and things from Gavin and other people saying, don't worry, there's there's very powerful white cards in this set. Mm -hmm. So they think there's very powerful white cards in this set. There is very, very powerful white card in this set. Right. And, and so that's a problem when they, they're like, they're aiming and they hit, think they hit the target, but I think they missed it. And that's just a, 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 that's a problem where it's like, I just think they're aiming at the wrong target. So yeah, because there's not a single white card in the set that will draw you cards, right? I don't think so. Maybe on the commons, uncommons that we may Maybe have missed, partners, but, but I even that. would have, I would have been looking for them. I mean, that's yeah. the thing that the white needs more than anything else. Yeah. And if you had to choose between our two pillars of the format, card draw or ramp, you know, we say you need both. I would choose card draw if, I, if it was gun to my head and I had to choose one. Yeah. So that's the more important of the two because card draw will help you hit land drops. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Whereas ramp won't help you draw cards. Right. And so oftentimes you'll get a ramp heavy hand that just ends in nothing because right. you can't do anything with no cards in your hand. Yeah. So yeah, it's a little disappointing. I, I, Keeper of the Cord. I think that card's really, really good. 
and I'm happy about it. So More I'm more like it. Figure out what White's impulsive draw is. If Red has impulsive draw, what is White's version? That's the thing I keep asking. Um, Red, however, is doing much better. Yeah. Much, much better. Yeah. Elena Kessick Trapper is a ramp card and a creature. We have Hellkite Courser for card advantage, and there's so much more impulsive draw. Uh, Jessica's, Jessica's will. Will. Oh my gosh. Shoot, Red got a freaking in- ancestral recall or a better like version yeah, of it. Wheel of Misfortune, I think, is also card just, draw. You know, massive That's straight up card draw. Card. Wheel of Fortune is card draw. Wheel of Misfortune also card draw. Red made out really well. Well, yeah, they also, all the red partners were awesome, mm-hmm. and they have tons of artifact matters stuff with Dargo and Tago, and then they and then big damage is yeah. now the big thing now that they have Soul Fire Eruption, Port Razor. Yeah, I think so. they're they're just knocking it out of the park with red. Like yeah. red just did amazing in the set. A lot of cool little things too. Like we said that that deck that's coming together with I'll, I'll control the combat stuff mm-hmm. or how combat, mm-hmm. combat works. Hellkite Corsair, a lot of cool uh, comboy stuff you can do with it. Yeah, but also just a lot of like staple-y type. I think Wheel of Misfortune and Jessica's Will. Those are two cards you're putting in most decks that have red in them. Yeah. You should, yeah. Yeah, and I don't like that white is just going towards like, well, you got Boros and you got equipment because that's kind of it. Like Boros, the nice thing about Boros is that the partner commanders open up more options, but it's not like the options are that juice here great because again, you're just going to find yourself at a disadvantage if you're looking for those sort of, in, you know, the card draw or the ramps of the format, so. My worry is too that like, we don't need white to get good stuff at the same rate as other colors because that's just going to keep it yeah, in the we actually position. They have to hurry it up. They actually need to be getting good stuff more often than other colors. And what's happening every single set, this set is no different, is that the other colors get more good stuff than white gets. Yeah. And so even though white does get some good stuff, they're still falling behind. And we need them to get three good cards to every two cards that the other colors get to start catching up. Yeah, and even then, white, again, when you compare the courts, when you compare a lot of the cycles, white is just not coming out on top of those either. So they're losing a it was lot two of green their battles. And what was the other one we liked? Blue, blue red. We liked the we liked the uh, well the green red. sorcery, the yeah. green court, and the red will. Yeah. So it was green, green, red came out on top in those cycles. Yeah. Mm, good time. Okay. All right. Well, to the listeners, what do you think about all the cards we talked about this episode? We're not done yet. We have one more set review where we're going to cover the other cards, the lands, as the well most as powerful the colors. colorless ones. Yeah. Um, you know, are you? do you have a favorite court? Are you going to be playing these nine mana sort of big spells in any of your decks? If so, how are you going to do it? And how do you want to impact the game when you do? Yeah. Interesting to hear if there's any cards also that we didn't talk about today. You know, we can't talk about every single card. Is there anything that we... Yeah, we're already on two hours almost, I yeah, think. Yeah, is so. there anything that we missed? Bring those up in the comments. Um, if you're going to buy any of these cards, or it's the holiday season, so if you want to purchase anything yes. as gifts for friends and family, Commander Legends, you know, is on the tip of everybody's tongue. That is what they want to get in their stockings or under the tree or whatever mm-hmm. this year. Cardkingdom.com slash command zone is the place to get it. Oh, this time of year, it can be dicey if you go to untrusted sources to purchase your things, too. Yes. If they say they're going to get you something by the time, by a certain time, they're going to get it to you by then, which I can't always say with all on, online retailers. So this is the time of year that I like to go with really trusted ones because their reputation's on the line. If they say, you're going to get this by December it, 22nd, yeah. then you will. I want to know that I'm with a reputable you know, dealer. And Card Kingdom is one of the places they say they're going to get it to you at a certain time, they're going to get it to you at a certain And they time. have customer service, right? And you know, so many people have told me they've had great customer service because the USPS has been slowed down and that's the yeah. primary way that a lot of cards get out there. So if you want to get those cards, get on it right now at cardkingdom.com slash commands them before it's too late and of course ultra pro products are available on card kingdom as well as at your local retailer your lgs if you want to support them as well as ultra pro has an online site help bling out someone's deck help them make that full complete collection right what is the stocking stuffer that's an amazing place to get at uh, ultra pro stuff so you notice they've been using old sleeves or something get them a whole brand new set of sleeves yeah that'd be awesome yeah for sure ultra pro really is the the products that Jimmy and I use for our own collections. We can't speak highly enough of them. All right. No end step today because we are doing a million episodes and we just don't have cool stuff to talk about. We'll be back to end steps probably in 2021. And yeah, my throat hurts. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, clean up step. Our editing, graphics, and logistics team at the Command Zone. We have Craig Blanchett, Manson Lung, Ashlyn Rose, Lady Danger, Jake Boss, Josh Murphy, Alfred DeStock, Patrick Non, Sam Waldo, Arthur Metacroft, and Jordan Pridgen, who's been writing some of those hilarious ads so you can send some of them some love. I believe we show their socials at the end of the videos if they're not there. Uh, just tweet at us and let us know. And special thanks to Jeffrey Palmer, who helps us out with the living card animations that begin this show and often go behind us in the windows, although Sam did this one. Yeah, it's cool. But Jeffrey does a lot of them. Yeah. All right. All right, everybody. I think that's it. Yep, we will be back very soon for part two. Actually, and also, game nights uh, at the time you're watching this should Ooh. be coming up. The holiday episode very, very oh, soon. Oh, oh. Yeah, we had a really fun game. That's a that was a good one. Yeah. So uh, look forward to that, and we will look forward to talking to you soon. Bye bye. Peace.
For further inquiries, send an email to commandcast at rocketjump.com or ask us on Twitter at JF Wong and at Josh Lee Kwai. See you later, alligator. Greetings, humans. <laughs>